days left until opening day, the Diamondbacks return home to Chase Field for two more games before Monday night's opener against the St. Louis Cardinals. Tonight, Patrick Corbin takes the mound, looking to solidify his spot in the starting rotation. The gang is all here, and we're ready to roll. to be said for consistency when you can run the same guys out there at the same positions same spot in the batting lineup it really lends itself to guys working off of each other their skills complementing each other and I think the Diamondbacks are going about it exactly the right way yeah they've identified the players they want to build around and this is the year they have put together the team they want we'll talk more about that coming up next Brad Steinke joins us Brad has the latest on the injured Diamondbacks who we won't be seeing tonight plus a look at the pitcher we will be watching Patrick Corbin as he won a spot in the open Opening day roster. That's next. Jet, but the shenanigans well underway. Wade Miley, possibly the fourth start for the D-backs with a bubble on his head. Spring training moving from Salt River Fields, downtown Phoenix, 
to Chase Field, the D-backs in an exhibition matchup against the Cincinnati Reds. Now, the season starts for real on Monday, and three very important parts of this roster will not be available to go for the D-backs, all on the DL. Center fielder and leadoff man Adam Eaton strained a ligament in his throwing elbow. He is going to be down four to eight weeks. That is going to be very costly. I think a lot of D-back fans excited to see what this young man could do. Willie Bloomquist on Tuesday during a swing and spring training tour that or actually strained that oblique. He's down two to four weeks, and a newly acquired Cody Ross has a bad cap. He's been injured by that all spring training long. Earlier today, Kurt Gibson is telling us that he'll be on the DL most likely to start the season. But it's Para, Pollock, and Pennington filling in for those guys. We'll see how they can do. Tonight's starter, a guy who has a great deal at stake, Patrick Corbin, the left-hander warming up down to the bullpen. He wants to lock down that fifth and final spot in the D-backs rotation. A very good spring so far. Last year, decent numbers. Early spring training, an ERA of 3.66 for Gibson saying earlier in the spring training. Corbin was rushing things just a little bit because he's so competitive, got down on himself, but ever since then he has been very, very good. And the D-backs hoping that that young man can be the fifth starter. Most likely that decision will come on Sunday. But stay with us. It is exhibition baseball here at Chase Field. The D-backs and the Reds on Fox Sports Arizona. We come back. The guys will have the call. Steve Berthume and BB, Bob Brenly. Stay with us. It is home sweet home. And his Cincinnati Reds ready to play the first of two here tonight against the Arizona Diamondbacks. Dusty has BB been doing this for 20 years and doing it very well. As a matter of fact, Dusty, uh, one of the great managers in the game, uh, no matter where he ends up. Uh, Chicago had some great teams. San Francisco had some great teams, and he thinks he may have his best team yet here in Cincinnati this year. Yeah, they may be the runaway winners here in the NL Central. He, he's just won everywhere he's been, Dusty Baker. Here's his lineup tonight. And with the exception of Brandon Phillips at second base and Ryan Hannigan at catcher, you can expect that this is Cincinnati's opening day lineup. And quite a change over last year. Uh, Shin Suchu uh, going to give him a lot of on-base percentage. A guy capable of stealing some bases, hitting a few home runs, especially in that small ballpark in Cincinnati. Yeah, Chu will be the guy to watch in this lineup. He's over from Cleveland uh, with one year left on his deal. He's played right field. This year, though, he's going to be their leadoff man and play center. So it's going to be interesting to see how that works out in Cincinnati. On the mound tonight for the Diamondbacks, 23-year-old Patrick Corbin. Even though this is considered a spring training game, when you step on the bump in the stadium, uh, it's a whole different story. It'll be interesting to see how Patrick reacts tonight. You see the numbers from last season for left-hander Patrick Corbin. And it features a couple of different fastballs, a two-seam sinker and a four-seamer that he'll use up in the zone. A real good curveball, real good straight changeup. 
Those are the numbers on Patrick from last year. He's 3-0 this year in, uh, let's see, six appearances for starts. Defensively behind Patrick Corbin for Kirk Gibson's Arizona Diamondbacks. It looks as such, and maybe it looks like this is basically the opening day lineup. Yeah, you have to think so, not the opening day lineup that uh, Kirk Gibson envisioned, but we mentioned those late injuries in spring training, and A.J. Pollock's going to get an opportunity in center field, we assume. Cliff Pennington getting the nod at shortstop here tonight. The rest of the guys you're going to see a lot of this summer. Umpires here tonight at Chase Field. Wow, the panels are open, the roof is wide open. It is absolutely gorgeous. I just, I just heard somebody say play ball. There Sounds like is. a good idea. Hal Gibson uh, has home plate tonight. We're told it's Blake Davis, Adam Hamari, and Brad Myers on the bases, although you, uh, in doing some pregame scouting, as uh, you tend to do, <laughs> discover there, there may be a discrepancy here. Well, I ran into Paul Schneider, a longtime Major League umpire, and I said, what are you doing here? He says, I'm working. But uh, he wasn't listed on the umpires for tonight's game, so uh, we'll keep an eye Why on it. It's worked so well all spring. Why stop now? <laughs> Set for baseball here on a perfect night at Chase Field. The Arizona Diamondbacks and the Cincinnati Reds. First pitch from Patrick Corbin is a strike. No surprise that you uh, coming off the bench. I mentioned a high on base percentage guy, but uh, Dusty Baker teams are known for their aggressive at bats. They love to attack that first pitch in the sequence. Two fouls, one down the left hand side. You saw the numbers last year. 283, 16 homers, 67 RBIs in 155 games with Cleveland. He's had a very good spring. 366 as he steps in here. 15 for 41, two homers and three driven in. Patrick Corbett ahead here, 0 2. There's a looper to left field. Jason Kubel will watch it. Roll foul. Yeah, Chu, as I mentioned, with the on-base percentage, a career 381 on-base percentage. He's had three seasons in the majors of over 20 stolen bases. And I mentioned a great American ballpark in Cincinnati, very cozy ballpark, let's put it that way. He should hit 20 to 25 home runs easily. Yeah, that is a hitter's dream, great American ballpark. Nice block in the dirt there by Miguel Montero. Shin Su Chu has always been a somewhat underrated player. In fact, he is the only player in Indians history to hit 300 with 20 homers and 20 steals in back-to-back -back seasons. Did that in 2009 and 2010. Couple of breaking balls buried in the dirt off of that outside corner. You may watch at home and say, geez, a bad pitch, way out of the strike zone. But when you're heading the count 0 and 2, you can afford to waste a couple of pitches out of the zone, hope to get you to chase something bad. He bounced both of those curveballs just off of the outside corner on purpose. Here's the 2 2. Got the outside corner. Hal Gibson, ring him up, sit him down. Well, after those couple of breaking balls in the dirt, comes back with that four-seam fastball in the outside corner, spotted perfectly. Looked like Chu was having a little trouble catching up to that Corbin fastball. So one down here in the Cincinnati first, and that brings up Jason Donald, the second baseman. Last year, Donald played 43 games with Cleveland, hit 202. Well, come opening day, we'll see a different second baseman for the Reds. That dude, BP, <laughs> on the Twitter. Right. Brandon Phillips. And he'll be betting in the same spot. The uh, What they expect the lineup to be is the same as it will be tonight in terms of the batting order, except you'll have Phillips hitting second and Ryan Hannigan in all likelihood behind the plate batting eighth for Dusty Baker, although they do definitely consider Devin Mesoraco the catcher of the future. He'll be a guy to watch. There's Ryan Hannigan from Andover, Mass, getting the night off, at least for now. Here's the 2-0. Foul down the right field line. Jason Donald, 63 games at AAA Columbus last year, hit 277. He was up and down from AAA last season with the Indians, had three different stints with Cleveland, and he came to Cincinnati from Cleveland along with Shin Su Chu, one of the pieces that moved to the big three-team trade that also included the Diamondbacks. Reds ended up sending D.D. Gregorius here to Arizona. A little extra hop on that fastball for Patrick Corbin tonight, consistently pitching in 93-94 with that four-seam fastball up in the zone. Yeah, that's the velocity has been up a tick or two this spring, BB. Last season, his four-seam averaged 91 and a half, but it, it's hit consistently this spring, 93 and 94. And Charles Nagy and company, happy to see that. Here's the 2-2. Just missed. It's run full. 
You may ask yourself, how do you improve your velocity? A lot of times it's a mechanical issue. Uh, you get your body in a better position. You get your arm in a better throwing position earlier in your delivery. Sometimes it's work in the weight room, get a little stronger, a little more arm strength. But whatever the reason, Patrick Corbin throwing harder this year. There it is. Chopper third base side, Prado. Easy throw across, two down. You also have to remember, B.B., in talking about Pat Corbin, he's only 23 years old, turns 24 on July 19th. Just a baby. <laughs> he's got a lot of innings left in that left arm. And here's Joey Votto. What a year he had last year, despite the, the knee injury that was a real problem. 337, only 14 homers and 56 RBIs. Led the league in walks and on base percentage. 474 OBP last year in their first strike. One of the more interesting characters in Major League Baseball, obviously one of the best hitters in the game, but uh, you cannot outwork this guy. Longtime announcer Marty Brenneman for the Cincinnati Reds said only Pete Rose had a similar work ethic to Joey Votto, and that's about as high a praise as you can get. And you know what? He's, a, he's an introverted guy. He's a quiet by, uh, guy, but he's also a good teammate. In fact, he was a little concerned he wouldn't be able to communicate with Araldus Chapman, so he learned Spanish. Boy, you love that. Took the time of the offseason to visit several times a week with a Spanish tutor just so that he could talk to his new teammate. He figured, you know what? This guy is going to be a key to our team. I need to be able to talk to him. Got a hitter's count there. Corbin missed. It's 3-1 and one now. Here's Martin Prado at third. We'll see a little bit of him in the outfield, we anticipate, over the course of the early portion of the season with Adam Eaton out. Corbin walks Votto, and that's what Joey Votto does. He gets on base. 474 last year. That was a Reds record. So a walk and a strikeout here in the first for Patrick Corbin. And with two outs, it's Ryan Ludwig. Yeah, you know, Paul Goldschmidt is... Uh, Got his ears wide open down there at first base. We talk about Goldie all the time and how he wants to learn, how much he wants to get better, and the guy standing right next to him, a good guy to learn from. Yeah, Joey Votto is almost on a Ted Williams level in terms of studying the science of hitting. I mean, he really looks at it from an analytical point of view. Votto holding. Ludwig checks swing. It's a ball. Ludwig last year, 275, 26 homers, 80 RBIs, a very productive year. But one that started out with Dusty Baker saying simply, you know what, left field's up for grabs. It's Ludwig or Chris Heisey. And in fact, that's what Baker said. I put it up for grabs. Ludwig got hot there, and we got hot. He really did have a good year. In fact, Dusty says it's Ludwig who makes his lineup go. He's the most important right-handed piece between Joey Votto and Jay Bruce in this order. Not only that, he plays a real good defensive outfield. I thought he was one of the better right fielders in the game when he was uh, on the other side of the outfield, but uh, playing left for the Reds and doing a fine job out there as well. Is there a specific term for a guy that throws left and bats right? It's interesting about those guys, isn't it? Yeah, Ricky Henderson. There have been many others, but... Ryan Ludwig, a left-handed thrower, right-handed hitter. Ludwig knocks one into right for a base hit. So two outs and two on for the Reds. Here's Jay Bruce. Now this is something the veteran Ryan Ludwig will do as well. Take advantage of the weakness in the defense. Goldschmidt holding on Votto over there at first base. Joey Votto had to hold up momentarily to let that ball sneak through into right field. But... It's a good piece of veteran hitting by Ryan Ludwig that, right there. That was interesting because he and Goldie sort of froze at the same moment, and it's like one was waiting for the other to move. So here's Bruce. And yeah, this guy can hit home runs. Wow. There's a drive to left right on cue. Jay Bruce, Kubel at the track, and he has it. And that's the beginning. But the Reds get a hit. They leave two. We'll go bottom first here at Chase Field. Reds and Diamondbacks scoreless.
backs ready to bat at the bottom of the first here at Chase Field against the Reds after a scoreless top half of the first against Pat Corbin. Kirk Gibson, his fourth season as the D-back skipper. And BB, here's his lineup tonight. This should be what we see on opening day, except for Ian Kennedy at the bottom. Yeah, well, you certainly expect so. Gerardo Parr at the top, Martin Prado, Aaron Hill, Miguel Montero, Paul Goldschmidt, Jason Kubel, A.J. Pollock, Cliff Pennington, and the pitcher spot. Looked pretty good to me. Tonight they'll face Bronson Arroyo. Last year, 12 and 10, a 3.74 ERA in 32 starts, 202 innings, gave up 209 hits and 129 strikeouts. This guy is the very definition of a workhorse. Oh, he, he just takes the ball every time it's his turn. He's out there giving Dusty innings, keeping his team in ball games. I, I normally tell you what a pitcher throws. <laughs> it's a little easier with the Royal to tell you what he doesn't throw. He doesn't throw a knuckleball, but everything else is game. And he doesn't throw anything in the 90s. Other than that, he may throw the rosin bag up there. He'll change arm angles. He'll drop down to sidearm on occasion. Very distinctive leg kick before delivering that ball to home plate. He's one of a kind. A little 73 mile an hour floater in there to Gerardo Parra. There's the rosin bag. Doesn't have <laughs> stitches on it, so. Parra swing and a miss there. Yeah, it's very funny the leg kick on Bronson Arroyo. Uh, it, it's almost parallel to the ground at one point. That front leg, almost like a stork. He's a long-legged guy. He's a big guy, 6'3". There's his numbers last year. So watch the leg kick here, and it's just even. Look at that. <laughs> you could pull a hamstring just watching him pitch. This is what this the batter sees. It's a slight hesitation as he gets that left leg extended up above his waist and then turns and delivers the ball to home plate. A little deception involved there. It's like one of those limbo bars. <laughs> Here's the one two to Para. Bronson Arroyo will almost never throw you a fastball with a velocity reading that starts with a nine. And he said this spring about his below average velo. I saw last year that basically that's all I got. Most days 87 to 89. Another one, two. Gerardo Parra making him work. Here's the velocity on Bronson Arroyo, BB. Dusty Baker said that when he watched Arroyo pitch, he, it reminded him of former Expo and Giants great Kirk Reeder. Yeah, take advantage of the hitter's aggressiveness rather than try to add and do something you can't do. Throw harder, take a little more off. Parra laces one to center field. Shinsu Chu backing up on the run at the track. Loud one out for the D-backs here in the first. Parra gave it a ride. And Chu looked just fine on that one. He's got a lot of center field, BB, to cover out there. A lot of ground. Yeah, a lot of room to cover. Um, you know, Jay Bruce, an adequate defender in right field. Good throwing arm, but doesn't cover a lot of ground. Ryan Ludwig, we've talked about a good defender in left field. But Chu's going to have a lot of ground to cover. Once again, though, 81 games at Great American Ballpark. Not nearly as much territory to cover. Yeah, and progressive field in Cleveland got big, too, so. Here's Martin Prado. Martin last year in Atlanta, 301. 10 homers, 70 RBIs. On base about 36% of the time. Chopper third base side. Todd Frazier is there and on the grass. Long throw, two down. Todd Frazier, former Little League World Series hero, hero from uh, Toms River, New Jersey. Second hey, every time a Diamondbacks player hits a home run this season, Fulton Holmes will donate $150 to the Central Arizona Mountain Rescue Association. That's $150 bucks from Fulton Holmes for every D-back home run. Here's Aaron Hill. Speaking of home runs, what a season he had last year and what a spring he's having. Aaron Hill last year. 302. What didn't he do? 302, 26 homers, 85 RBI. And Aaron having a great spring, stepping in here at 404. 19 for 47, a homer, and 13 RBI in 18 games. Slow breaking ball is in there. <laughs> Aaron's got an on base percentage this spring of 434. He's slugging 596 here in spring training. Every hitter goes through good streaks and bad streaks over the course of the season, but Aaron Hill seems to be able to minimize the bad streaks and maximize the good streaks as good as any hitter I've seen. 26 homers, 44 doubles, 85 RBIs last year. 
He led all National League second baseman in average homers, doubles, RBIs, total bases, on base, and slugging. Wow. And, of course, hit for the cycle twice. Oh, by the way. 3-2. Shortstop, Zach Cozart, long throw. What a nice pick by Joey Votto at first base. Three up, three down for the D-backs here in the first. We're through one. No score from Chase Field. Score Reds and Diamondbacks as we visit with D-back skipper Kurt Gibson. Gibby, how's it feel to be back in the old hometown here, back in the home park? Very nice. Nice office. It is, isn't it? Panels open, roof open, great night. Hitters love that when the panels and the roof are open. What's the plan for Patrick Corbin tonight? Uh, probably at least five innings. We'll see how many pitches he's got through there, but uh, he'll have an extra day if he starts uh, the next time, so uh, might extend him a little bit. We'll just see how he gets there. Is tonight the final audition do you look at the body of work over the spring how critical is tonight in deciding who gets that fifth starter spot I think all of the above and you know even what he did for us last year you know and uh, he's been working on a couple of things throughout the spring we've tried to refine uh, some of his weapons against certain get certain type guys where we want him to throw the ball so he'll be working on that tonight and uh, you know after tomorrow Wade will throw and Delgado will throw and then uh, we'll make a decision probably after tomorrow night's game never easy decisions are they skipper well, I mean, you got to do them. The guys have competed great. They've been great throughout camp. They've done what we've asked them to do. And uh, one of these young men won't be in the opening uh, on the opening day roster, but we know we've got great depth should we need one of them. Gibby, I get asked by D-backs fans all the time, uh, will the guy or two guys that don't get that fifth spot become relievers? And you and KT have said, and you've been consistent with this all through camp, that no, they will remain starters. They'll just pitch somewhere else. Could you explain why you, you want to do that? Well, I think at one time when Wade was questionable whether he'd be healthy and he might have went on the disabled list, we could have possibly went with four starters so that we have an off day the first time through. We would have needed a, a fifth starter till the ninth against Pittsburgh. So there would have been a possibility that uh, they could have, one of them could have went in the bullpen. Uh, but it looks like Wade's healthy. Uh, he's going to throw tomorrow. We expect everything to go well, and we, we expect to go with five starters. So the others, we'd keep them uh, throwing and extended out in the minor leagues in case we needed some depth down the road. Enough about the pitchers. Let's talk about your hitters. You're facing a guy like Bronson Arroyo tonight who throws the kitchen sink up there, a lot of off-speed pitches, a lot of breaking balls. How do you prepare your hitters to face a veteran like Bronson Arroyo? Well, I think you got to stay middle of the field. Last time we faced him here last year, we got after him pretty good. The guys had a good approach. Like you'll, you'll see Goldie. I think you'll see Goldie next thing. He'll move up in the box. Uh, you know, different guys like Haley, he says he looks up on him, but... Uh, though he's not throwing the ball very hard, he's very deceptive. He's got a lot of different pitches, eight of them or so. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you got to figure something out. You just can't go up there and try to wail and pull him to, you know, pull him out of the ballpark because he'll, he'll, he'll have you eaten out of his hand. That won't work good for us. 
Gibby, you mentioned Paul Goldschmidt, and nothing official has been announced, of course, yet, but it has been reported an extension for Goldie, five years, $32 million, and an option for another season after that. Could you tell people what you see when you watch Paul Goldschmidt come to work every day? Because it's remarkable. Yeah, a couple years ago, actually, when I was hired, uh, KT and I sat down, and one of the things that came out of our conversations throughout the winter and pre-spring training that year was, what is the Diamondback way? And, uh, you know, Paul Goldschmidt uh, exemplifies that. Uh, he does everything for the team. He's got high aspirations for himself. He prepares uh, prior to the game, during the game. Uh, he's always chatting with his teammates post game uh, and he just his great work and never gives in and uh, is well respected by his teammates and just the kind of guy if you were going to give a guy an extension he would be the kind of person you do that to. Hey Gibby is it a big deal to play a couple of night games here at the end of spring training so you can get used to what you're going to be doing most of the time during the regular season? You know the first time we played a night game was against the Mexico WBC team thought the guys had trouble with the lights to be honest with you it was the first time we've played a couple of them since then but now here we're in chase field different backdrop you know the guys love the batter's eye here so yeah, i do like it tomorrow we'll have a quick turnaround uh, we'll have a day game and uh, you know that's something to get used to as well but uh, we've uh, prepared i think pretty well for the, the the tough season that we're going through was that ball inside or was it right there let's take a look mitch can we get a replay for gibby i know he's been right there off the corner <laughs> I mean, we've kind of found throughout the spring training that uh, the minor league guys, the guys haven't been up here a lot. They're a little tighter, so. Now we're going to take a look right now. Let's see. Here's but the give pitch me a, from give Patrick me a, Corbin. Give, give me a report. That's a boo. Yeah, just missed inside. Might have yeah. slid in there just a little yeah, bit. Just yeah. I know if BB was back there, he'd be he'd be politicking right now, would you, BB? Uh, that's be a strike. doing something, yeah. yeah that's a strike. <laughs> Can you explain for folks watching what the process is for you and your staff on this final weekend? In turn, and it's not just about Patrick Corbin. It's about the whole 25-man roster and where everyone else goes. What's the process on this final weekend in terms of roster yeah. spots and deciding who goes where? Yeah, we'll just kind of give everybody their last opportunity, so to say, and then uh, we'll have meetings on a daily basis. A lot of what goes in uh, this weekend is really preparing for our opener against the Cardinals, our advance reports. We've put a lot of work in those today. What we're going to present to the players, uh, we all have a, a pregame meeting on Monday with the players. We do, we do, uh, you know, every series that we start and try and tailor it so you give them good information quick. Don't want to bore them. Uh, don't want them to lose their attention span, and uh, you know, kind of, you know, prep them to know what they're going to be up against and take that information and execute it within the game. We've kind of done that really lately in spring training. Kind of challenge them to do different things and see if they would do execute execute the game plan. Give you any injury news? Are we so many guys uh, walking wounded? Adam Eaton and Willie Bloomquist and Cody Ross. Any injury updates on those guys? Well, Cody's going to start on the disabled list. Uh, we've had him hitting over the minor league side. No running. He took BP today. He jogged yesterday. Did a pretty good job. He'll jog again tomorrow. Um, we want to make sure when we bring him back that uh, he, uh, you know, he's back for good. We don't want him to come back too early and then get injured and go back on the disabled list. Kurt Gibson, give me thanks. We'll see you on opening thanks day. Thanks for having me, guys.
Matt Corbin, Dean Bax coming up now, batting in the bottom of the second against Bronson Arroyo. Hey, BB, we're on the Twitter this year. We're, we're going to try this out. And it's our Twitter poll question. We'll do this once every night. And tonight's question is, what is your favorite thing about opening day? So what you do is you do your hashtag there, pick one of the four, and tweet your vote to at Fox Sports AZ. So it's baseball is back. That's always good. Mm -hmm. The pregame ceremony with the flyovers and the anthem and the intros and the whole thing. Playing hooky, which is basically blowing off work to go see all this. <laughs> or just coming and chowing down, eating all the ballpark food like, I'll see there's lots of good food out there. Oh, so yeah. whatever you think is the best thing about opening day, tweet it to Fox Sports AZ, and we'll have the results of the poll later in the broadcast. I always felt the best thing about opening day was getting it over. So you could get into <laughs> the grind of the season. You know, it's it's a, it's a it's an event, opening day. You're not a showy guy. No. no I, that's not all the pomp, the circumstance, the whole thing. You, just you don't need that. Play ball. Let's go. Roll out the balls and let's do it. Yeah, I mean, you know, the players get in, into a routine. They have a certain thing they do at a certain time every day. They eat at the same time. They lift at the same time time they go to batting practice at the same time and opening day disrupts all of that you've got media here at the ballpark that you won't see again until the postseason <laughs> and uh <laughs> you know a full house full of fans it's tough to get to the ballpark uh, on opening day but uh, then game two you settle into your routine is there anything that you like about opening day well i like the fact that it is opening day and there's 161 more to go after we get that first one out of the way relax kid after this we got 161 more of these with Pennington and Daniel Hudson looking on. Huddy, uh, by the way, there's been good news on him this spring. Threw off a mound for the first time this week, and uh, he's progressed very well coming off Tommy John. Still hopes to be back in midseason. Yeah, we talked uh, about the depth with, uh, you know, whichever guys lose out on the uh, on the fifth man in the rotation job, having some depth at the AAA level, and at some point Daniel Hudson will be back uh, lending even more depth to a good rotation. If you add Huddy back into the mix, and then you consider the young guys with Skaggs and Corbin and Delgado and on down the line, and don't forget Archie Bradley, who's mm -hmm. a bit further behind, uh, wow, it's a pretty impressive collection. And one thing we've learned uh, over the years of watching Major League Baseball, you can never have too many. You're going to need them all. Yep. 2-2 two -two to Miguel Montero. Miggy last year, 286, 15 homers and 88 RBIs. And we talked earlier in our pregame about how the Diamondbacks have identified the core group that is going to be the offensive unit here, and they have locked them all up long term. This this is a group that will be together now, just the offensive guys now, for the next three, four, five years. Miggy launches one to center, and it drops in for a base hit. Miguel Montero, that's his 11th hit of the spring, now 11 for 38. Well, we were talking about opening day here. It's Monday, April 1st at Chase Field. The D-backs take on the St. Louis Cardinals at 7:10. Be sure to come early and enjoy the opening day street festival just outside Chase Field. It includes music, food trucks, more pregame entertainment, opening day tickets still available. You can call 602-462-4600 or log on to dbacks.com slash tickets. And that's some of the stuff, BB, that you were... Speaking about the food trucks and the festivals and the whole thing. Well, don't get me wrong. I love opening day for the fans. You know, after a long, hard winter waiting for baseball to start again, why not hang some bunting and play some music and dance in the streets uh, in anticipation of a great baseball season? Bunting. Yeah, that should have been one of the uh, hashtag options. <laughs> hashtag bunting. Here's Goldie. Center field. He's going to hang up there, drifts over toward right field now. There's Jay Bruce, one down. Montero scampers back to first base. I, I would assume that the Twitter generation uh, yes. isn't big on bunting. You know. Well, the problem is when you when you put bunting on Twitter, people go crazy because it's, it's supposed to be fundamentally unsound in terms right. of the whole money ball thing. They don't actually mean that you're talking about the red, white, and blue stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Bunting what? I mean, Joe, I mean. When Joe Torre was bunting in the World Baseball Classic, Twitter was exploding. Here's Jason Kubel. Jason last season, his first as an Arizona Diamondback, provided some tremendous power, 253, 30 homers and 90 RBI. And now he's here, his ninth season in the big leagues, his second here with the D-backs. What a line drive stopped by Joey Votto. They get the play at second, and there it is. Joey Votto. Look at this defensive play. Lay it out, hit right to him. He snags it, and then they have to force on Montero. Joey Votto, he's not all about the offense. There's the diving stab and the throw to second. Diamondbacks out of the second. We'll go top three. Still no score.
field. Reds and Diamondbacks still no score. We're joined in the booth here by the president and CEO of the Arizona Diamondbacks, Derek Hall. Good to have you here. Steve, Welcome. Bob, good to be here. Thanks. Not Maybe. only that, one of the best auctioneers in oh, the Valley. Wow. It was much better than I was last night. No, you at know, it's on the diamond. You, I, we raised 1.8 million last year. 1.8 million. Wow. Uh, yeah, last night we actually did 820,000 on the live auction. So it's it's amazing how how well this community does, how generous this community is, and how supportive they are of the Diamondbacks Foundation. It was quite a night last night, evening on the diamond. It, it's just such a beautiful job. You have the stage where Chicago was set up, and then you have all the tables out spread across the diamond. There it is. This is last night here at Chase Field. There was a silent auction. There was the live auction. There was dinner. I mean, what a night Chicago played. It's really quite an event. Yeah, it's become really one of the uh, most popular events here in the Valley, and we hear the feedback from all of those that, that, that are here and, you know, buying tables and participating in the silent and the live auction, but just so proud of our corporate partners, our players, all of our coaching staff, everyone involved with the event. It's just gotten bigger and bigger, and our seventh annual has grown to a, a whole new level. It's a whole new record. Now, you're here to talk about uh, the team's work with the March of Dimes as well. I am indeed. You know, March of Dimes is the 75th anniversary. I've been asked to be the chair for the walk, the March, March for Babies, and that is on April 13th. We have set up a way for fans and, and those interested in giving. And so you heard from Janice Decker earlier, but we actually have it through our website. If you go to dbacks.com slash healthy, healthy babies. babies, yep, and with the 75th anniversary, people can donate money, and it's a good time, too, right now, obviously, for research and prevention and making sure that we do have healthy babies. There are going to be premature babies, uh, but we need to make sure that we have research so that we can stop and, and somehow take care of birth defects because uh, so many people have been affected by some sort of premature birth or some sort of uh, birth defect. And so March of Dimes does just such great work. And the marches, it's a great time. It's down by the Capitol. It's April 13th. We even have Lisa Bloomquist is going to be out there and kick off the walk. Willie's wife, she, they both had a premature baby. But uh, who doesn't want to do good for babies, right? Yeah. And you can help again by going to dbacks.com slash healthy babies. And because it's the March of Dimes 75th anniversary, if you can, try and donate $75. Absolutely. So when you go on to dbacks.com slash healthy babies, you're going to have a way to register and, and insert whatever amount of money you want to. We're hoping for $75, $750, $7.50 if you can, $15 if you can, whatever it is. But let's give money because this is a very important cause, and this is a big year for March of Dimes, the 75th. And, Derek, I think one of the best parts about this is that in Arizona, over 87% of every dollar goes right back into the mission. Yeah, that's what's so important. There's really not overhead. You're not wondering if the money's going to GNA. It's going right to the research and, and, and finding cures. It's not just about premature babies anymore with March of Dimes. You're talking about cancers. You're talking about everything that affects all of us. And, you know, you look at the amount of healthy babies last year that were born. That's because of March of Dimes. And, again, you can help by going to dbacks.com slash healthy babies and try and donate whatever you can. Ideally, we'd like $75 to commemorate the March of Dimes 75th anniversary. There it is one more time. And don't forget, of course, April 13th, the three-and-a-half-mile walk to raise money for research and education. You excited for opening day? I cannot wait. I cannot wait. You know, it's been such a good spring. The fans were out again in full force. We ended up with the largest attendance in, in all the baseball for the third straight year. That says a lot about Salt River Fields, but it says a lot more about the excitement and passion that our fans have for this team, and it spills over. You know, we're getting close to a sellout now on opening day. We will sell out. There's still tickets available, but we really have to focus on that Tuesday and Wednesday as well. And, you know, there's been times where there's been that letdown. Really, with every team, you go from the opening day, Monday, to being a sellout, and you worry about those next crowds. You don't want to have 16,000, 17,000. Well, again, so much excitement for this team and this product that we put on the field. We're already in the 20s for both of those games. Just saw Ian Kennedy. He'll, of course, be the opening day starter for the D-backs. Patrick Corbin looking very good tonight. D-backs president and CEO, Derek Hall. Derek, thanks very much. Steve, Bob, thank you. Whatever you can do, help out March of Dimes.
A.J. Pollock, Cliff Pennington, and Pat Corbin here in the D-backs third. No score against the Reds, and B.B., Pat Corbin is cruising here tonight. He's looked great. Yeah, making it look easy. Yeah, you like to see that. Yeah, he, he's found a nice rhythm out there on the mound. Miguel Montero keeping him working fast, throwing strikes, getting a lot of quick outs. Corbin has four strikeouts tonight, and he has retired the last seven he's faced. Looking very good. A.J. Pollock, we saw the numbers 247, two homers, eight RBIs last year. And he, in all likelihood, will be the opening day center fielder. AJ's had an interesting spring. They really like what they've seen because he does BB a little bit of everything as uh, Adam Eaton will begin the season on the DL. He, I mean, he, he's very good, very fundamentally sound guy. He's got a little bit of power in the bat. He throws well. He fields well. He's got good uh, base running instincts and good speed out there. He does. He gives you just a little bit of everything. Yeah, and it's all good. Uh, unfortunately, it's not quite the same package that Adam Eaton brings to the table. Yeah, obviously a, a big injury for the Diamondbacks with Adam Eaton going down with the elbow injury. I, I think it's kind of been downplayed a little bit, but that guy is going to be a key part of this oh. team, especially offensively and his ability to get on base and wreak havoc on the other team. He was on base the entire spring. Yeah. Every time you looked up, A.J. Pollock, nice backhand stop there by Todd Frazier, long throw, and there's the Pollock speed, he beats it out, Frazier made a nice play, but A.J. got up the line, second straight ending the D-backs have had a leadoff single. Slight bobble by Frazier down there at third base, nice backhanded pick, a tough hop as he moves his way toward that third baseline, smothers the ball, right there, had just a little trouble finding the handle, you mentioned the speed of Pollock. Busting it down at first baseline, earns himself an infield hit. And there's the reaction from Todd. Here's Cliff Pennington. Base hit for A.J. Pollock. Second of the game for the D-backs. Pennington last year hit 215. Six homers, 28 RBIs in Oakland. 28 years old. This is his sixth big league season and his first professional season outside the A's organization. I tell you, Bert, for a guy that has such an exaggerated leg kick out of the windup, he can unload the ball very quickly out of the stretch. He will occasionally show you the high leg kick out of the stretch, but more often than not, especially with a potential base dealer on, you'll see a very abbreviated move to home plate with that left leg, just picks his foot up and strides toward his catcher. Sort of a, a royal version of the slide step? Yeah. Watch that front leg. There yeah. it is. Just a little kick. <laughs> Well, you can imagine if Bronson Arroyo tried to use that high leg kick with a runner at first base, uh, he'd have guys in scoring position all night long. So he's modified his delivery out of the stretch. It's very effective. Gives his catcher a chance to throw out those potential base stealers. And not only that, he's lobbing up breaking ball after breaking ball, which makes it even more hard to keep the runners in place if you're the catcher. Ground ball, second base. Can they turn it? Donald, Kozar, Votto. 4-6-3 on the double play. They've just changed the scoring now, BB. They have now ruled that an error on Todd Frazier. It was up there originally as a hit. They have now changed it, so Pollock had reached on an error by Todd Frazier. So well, as much as I'd like to see A.J. get a base hit, I, I think that's probably the right call. Frazier got to the ball in good shape, just mishandled it. Corbin skies one to shallow center. Chu coming in. And there it is. So it ends up being three up, three down. The Reds turn a double play behind Bronson Arroyo. We'll go top four. Still no score.
Reds. He's retired the last seven Reds he's faced. Looking very good here as we start a scoreless fourth inning at Chase Field. Second to last game of the spring training schedule. Then it's Monday night here. Opening night with Ian Kennedy on the mound against the St. Louis Cardinals. And Ian joins us here on Fox Sports Arizona. Ian, what have you been working on this spring? <laughs> I, know that I cheated. I know it's the curveball. Yes, and, yes. And that's been a work in progress. So, so sort of give us a scouting report now on the Ian Kennedy curveball. <laughs> uh, well, I just wanted to get up. Uh, it's nothing new to it. It's just more of getting the feel for it earlier this, this spring. And, um, you know, I haven't done it. It's not like something different in the past, but um, I know last year I didn't have that feel for it early on in spring, and at the end, I guess at the end of spring and early in the season. So that was the one thing I wanted to do, and um, you know, get my hands on and uh, start getting that over for strikes early on. Yeah, I, I looked at the numbers last year and the curveball frequency. There was a big drop from from 2011. Is that because you? Lacked a little faith in the pitch, and as you mentioned, didn't quite feel great about where you were with it? Yeah, it could be. Um, I, be I was asked that early on. Uh, I think Willie Bloomquist asked me, and I uh, I actually said, you know, I'll, I'll look it up, and I, I thought it was the same, but it might have. You know, but you're right. When you don't have the feel for it, you don't throw it as much. And um, you know, any other pitch, any other pitch you throw, is, you're not going to have a, a, that feel for it, and you're not going to throw it as much. You know, and you pitchers are, are a very tight fraternity. How often do you guys, uh, like, critique each other's mechanics or the grip on your curveball or the grip on your changeup? Uh, do you guys kind of work together to try to refine your pitches? Uh, we, do it, we do it quite a bit. Um, so much for mechanics and everything. When somebody's off, you kind of tell them. You see them so many times. Either, uh, you know, Nags will say the same thing. Um, we see a lot of different things, so. I'll bring it up to him and uh, first, and then I'll read it by Trevor or what, read it by Wade. And I didn't have to do it too many times with Wade last year because he was throwing pretty well, th pretty well last year. And uh, but for overall pitches, I'll ask like McCarthy. I asked how he threw his cutter. I know he has a good one, and um, there's some things like that. Well, and take it a step further. Joey Votto just flied out to left field. You got the veteran Ryan Ludwig here at the plate. If one of you guys has had great success against, let's say, Joey Votto, do the other guys pick your brain and try to figure out how have you been getting him out? Yeah, sometimes if you haven't figured somebody out, and you're like, okay, how do you get this guy out? And um, uh, foul ball. Strike. Um, yeah, strike. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you have some, you have somebody that it owns you, or you own somebody else, and they'll ask you the same thing, and. Um, you know, some, like Trevor. Trevor asked me, he's like, "What do you do? What do you do to this guy?" And I said, "I don't know. I throw a fastball up." He's like, "My ball sinks. It doesn't. It doesn't. I don't throw a high <laughs> fastball." And um, yeah, there's some things you can't do. I can't throw a sinker like Trevor does. <laughs> What's it mean to be the opening day guy again? Uh, you know, I don't take it for granted. It's it, it, when I was told, I still had the same smile on my face as I did the first time, and it, it's it's special because not many people get to do that in their career, um, if ever. And, you know, I, I know that this is my third time. I get on Monday night, do it again. It's it's special, uh, especially um, you do it at your own park. It's, 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 it's a little different than opening up on the road. Ludwig, that's why he was so dangerous last year. Lines a double to left center. What's it like to pitch in this ballpark, Ian? Because since we've been here tonight, and we have a scoreless game here, but the ball's been in the air all night long. Yeah, uh, you'll notice with the with the roof open and the fence open, sometimes the ball will travel out the left center. Um, you can feel it, you can feel a draft when you're on the field. It's not it's not too bad, but I don't really notice. It's way better than throwing at Salt River. You throw give up a fly ball and the ball goes out um, any time in spring training here. <laughs> yeah, you give a fly ball and you you look. Next thing you look, it's in the front row. <laughs> Ian, what was the conversation in the clubhouse today when everybody heard the Paul Goldschmidt news, which we should point out is not official, but it looks like Goldie's getting a long-term extension. <laughs> it, well, there wasn't much talk about it. I had to, I was stretching, and I was doing stuff in the weight room, and I looked up, and I saw on the bottom screen Paul Goldschmidt's size five-year extension. I, was, I just walked over, and, I said, and he, was, he was right next to me, and I said, oh, congratulations, I guess. I didn't. I mean, he's not going to go around and walk around, hey, guys, I signed an extension. Um, <laughs> May I have let, your just, attention, please? I just want to let everybody know. <laughs> he's not Ron Burgundy calling everybody out. <laughs> Kevin Towers has had a very busy offseason. Ian, we were talking about that, Bob and I, in a pregame show, that the Diamondbacks, it seems, have identified their core group of offensive players, certainly, and they're all now signed up long-term for the next three or four years. Yeah, it, 
you notice that and you notice um they're really dedicated and you know sorry I, I asked Aaron how many guys that is now just this off season we have not counting Miggy and um some other guys that we signed for a couple multi-year deals and um it's I, I like that core uh you know, like we were we were joking, like you said, a bunch of position players. There's stuff, <laughs> other stuff with uh, with pitchers. Well, I, I I should point out to you that Verlander got what? Let's see, what? Two hundred and two million dollars today. <laughs> uh, it'll be at least one hundred and eighty million. Yeah, that's. I, I have a feeling you noticed that on the bottom line when you were stretching. <laughs> I think he had his own category. Him and Buster had the same category. There their you own. go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Buster Posey, nine years, one hundred sixty-seven million from the Giants today. Yeah, that's. He's a good, really good player, he's a really good hitter. You know what he does with that pitching staff. Um, you know, playing against him, he, you know, he's a, he's one of the toughest outs we face in the National League. And um, and then he also talked about Verlander, one of the best pitchers in all of baseball. And can he continues to do what he does, he's going to be the best if he keeps that up. Ian Kennedy, Ian, thanks, man. We'll let you get back to enjoying the game. We appreciate it and look forward to watching you on an opening day here Monday night. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ian. That, that, BB, that is a big deal, I would think, to be a starting pitcher. Because no matter what you do in the major leagues in terms of wins and losses and everything else, that is something that stays on the resume. Absolutely. That opening day starter. I mean, there's a reason managers pick certain guys to be the opening day starter. I kind of jokingly talked about all the hoopla that goes on for opening day. and It does take a special pitcher to maybe be thrown out of his rhythm a little bit in preparation for that opening day start. And uh, in Kirk Gibson's estimation, Charlie Nagy, the pitching coach, they both feel that Ian Kennedy – is that guy that can handle that opening day pressure. Todd Frazier, a little chopper back to Pat Corbin. Spins and throws. Patrick Corbin cruising through four here. He's only given up two hits. He's got four strikeouts. Ian Kennedy will be fearing the red beard on opening night here against the Cardinals. Bottom four coming up. the fourth inning. We heard last inning from D-backs president and CEO Derek Hall how important the March of Babies Phoenix is to the D-backs and certainly it is very important to this couple right here. Lester and April Neil and their son Bryce. March of Dimes came into your life about five years ago. How did that unfold? Well our son Bryce was born at 27 weeks four days um, which is slightly under seven months. Um, he was born early. We didn't know the cause of it. I just went into basically my water broke and we didn't understand why. Um, one minute, you know, I was happily pregnant and not having any issues, and then next, you know, I was being aerovac from Chandler Regional to St. Joe's Hospital. So it kind of happened pretty quickly. And how did March of Dimes step up and help you get through what was obviously a very trying time? Um, the March of Dimes provided, um, starting with the helicopter ride from the hospital, that's part of, um, that, that partly helps us in order to help save your child's life because every second at that point in time could mean life or death. So them air evacuating, you know, me from Chandler Regional, basically getting me to the NICU, getting me to the proper care that I needed. Also, once Bryce was born, he was born Christmas Eve at 11.56 p.m. 
um, an emergency C-section, and then once you do that, you go basically they whisk your baby into the NICU, and then that's when the March of Dimes helps fund like any of the testing, anything that we need at that point in time to help save our child. And, and Lester, let me ask you, this was your first son, and, and when you find out that he's born that much pre prematurely, what goes through your mind? Well, first of all, he's not my first son. He is the youngest. Um, as a father, it's a tremendous amount. Um, a lot of people do not know about the, the emotional with having your wife on a deathbed basically and have your son being born and he's fighting uh, fighting for his life as well so it's a tremendous amount of this um, emotional drain on you but you have to be strong for your wife and you got to be just just dealing with the pain within in regards to what's going on with your son price let me ask you how you enjoyed the baseball game so far so but the baseball game is my favorite one which is they are the best <laughs> And let me also ask you, coming up on April 13th, the, the March of Babies Phoenix, how can people get involved? Obviously, dbacks.com, Healthy Babies, you're going to be down there as well. Yes, they can get involved by yeah, obviously going to the DBAX um, website for March for Babies and donating money. But also, if you'd like to go ahead and join up for a team, you can get on the March of Dimes um, Arizona chapter, sign up for a team, um, bring your friends, bring anyone. I mean, I know we have a huge amount of friends that are going to be coming out. My coworkers have kind of rallied behind us. Um, and just everything, you know, everything helps and everything, you know, every dollar matters and the money stays right here in Arizona. And I have to tell this story. You played hoops at U of A. You played hoops at Arizona State. How did you make this happen <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a long story but it's a beautiful story and it does have a twist um i, I married my stalker <laughs> oh. so embarrassing. and by the way he is uh, continuing his basketball career an assistant coach at scottsdale community college so uh, still active one-on-one uh, -on -one. could you take him no he yeah. dunks i, I can dunk. <laughs> i can't do that at all well, Lester, April, and, and Bryce, thanks for your time. And, and again, best of luck, and thanks for giving back to, to March of Dimes. Steve, we'll send it back to you. Brad, thanks very much. Aaron Hill up there after Martin Prado laced a base hit in the left field. Aaron Hill grounded a short his first time up. So Aaron now 19 for 48 on the spring. We heard Kirk Gibson talk earlier about facing Bronson Royo. Said Aaron Hill goes to the plate and looks for something up. Laying off a off-speed pitch that time down below the knee. See if he sticks with that program against Arroyo this time. He's likely to see a high fastball in the one-two count. Maybe elevated just above the top of the strike zone. Long set of signs from Matt Williams down at third. Prado off first. That was up. I wouldn't call it a fastball, but at <laughs> 74, it was up there around the shoulders. Arroyo BB had a huge scare in his last spring start. That was Sunday. He was pitching against Texas and was struck right on the outside of his pitching hand by a line drive shot off the bat of the Rangers' David Murphy. Said the comebacker hit him flush on the pitching hand so hard he still had a bruise on his forearm for where the ball ricocheted off his hand. That's how hard it hit him. Yeah, we were told by the time Dusty Baker, the manager, got out to the mound, Arroyo was telling him it's broken. There's no doubt it's broken. And uh, he still has a little swelling you see on the outside of that right hand, but hasn't hindered him from throwing any of his pitches tonight. This is there, and it's gone full three and two. And the amazing thing was when he woke up the next day, he was fine. I mean, there's still a little bit of a mark there, but he was throwing, said he felt great as it was as if he'd uh, never even been hit, which is... Nothing new for him because he in his career, Bronson Arroyo, has never been on the DL. Not one time. He currently holds an active streak of 506 professional starts as a pitcher without ever missing a single one. 506 in a row. That's He's taken the ball. So impressive. I can't tell you how impressive that is. The strain and the, the torque that major league pitchers generate on their elbow and their shoulder. The damage that has to be done in the right arm of Bronson Arroyo yet takes the ball every time it's his turn. 3-2 to Aaron Hill is skied away up third base side and it's going to be in the six. Yeah Bronson Arroyo has assembled a record of remarkable durability as a major league starting pitcher. He's thrown at least 200 innings in seven of his last eight seasons in the big leagues and the one year he didn't get to 200 he finished with 199. 199. 14-year career. He's 36, just turned 36 last month. 3-2 will do it again to Aaron Hill. Prado off first. 
center field. Now it's Jay Bruce drifting over to right. There it is. You know, we were talking about Bronson Arroyo and the high leg kick out of the windup with no runners on base, the much lower slide step. You'll see the difference here. The extension of the left leg on the left with nobody on base. And on your right out of the stretch position, barely picks that foot up off the ground, just slides it toward home plate, plants the left foot, delivers the pitch. So with two outs, here's Miguel Montero. Montero single back of the second, his 11th hit of the spring. So he steps in here 11 for 38. Looks at a strike. A little bit of a mini shift on the infield here by the Cincinnati Reds with Joey Votto holding on the runner at first base. You see the second baseman Donald cheating over into that hole. Shortstop playing up the middle. Todd Frazier over at the shortstop position. Yeah, if he hits it down the uh, left field line, he could run till next week. Well, he could run till later this evening. <laughs> <laughs> with Miggy? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Miggy, Miggy can tell you. He'll do everything. He's probably, he'll probably tell you that he's Carl Lewis out there. <laughs> It's amazing to spend time in camp around Miguel Montero because he's never stopped talking, not for one moment. And it's always, he's always just chirping out there. He's having fun. It's always very positive, upbeat. He's a very, very happy guy. And, and some guys are holler guys and rah-rah guys and that. Miguel Montero is not that. He's constantly energized. He's got a very carbonated personality. No question about it. High motor guy, they like to say. And he's, it's just he's always smiling, joking, laughing. It's terrific. And the thing I really love about Miguel Montero, and obviously I'm partial to catchers to begin with, but he has that gift. He's that one gets through Votto. Votto goes to third. First and third, two outs for the Diamondbacks here. Well, before we get a look at that replay, I was about to say that Miguel Montero has a gift. He can constructively criticize his teammates without them taking it defensive, oh, yeah. without getting defensive over the comment. Top spin grounder right down that first baseline. Just eats up. Joey Votto doesn't get the glove down quickly enough. Diamondbacks have him on the corners with two outs. And Paul Goldschmidt stepping in. Goldie flew out to right his first time up. 24 for 59 this spring as he steps in here. Reportedly has agreed to a five-year, $32 million contract extension with the Diamondbacks. Nothing official yet. Kurt Gibson told us earlier when we spoke to him from the dugout that against a basically a junk pitcher, I don't, I don't mean that in a derogatory fashion, but a guy like Arroyo who's not coming at you in the 90s, Gibby said that Goldie might move up in the box a bit. Goes down and gets one there and pops it straight up. Cozart wants it. That ends the inning. Two hits for the D-backs. They strand two. We're through four. Still no score.
in part by Papa John's. Better ingredients, better pizza. Papa John's, proud partner of the Arizona Diamondbacks. The UPS Store, the UPS Store. Flyers, business cards, brochures, and more. We can print that. George Brazil guarantees the lowest price on a new AC system. Call George today. Out by the pool here on a beautiful spring evening in Arizona. Chase Field, Reds and D-backs no score. And Steve Berthune, Bob Renly along the way. And BB, Pat Corbin is cruising along here. He's uh, given up only two hits. He has five strikeouts. He's retired 10 of the last 11 he's faced. And if this is the audition, uh, we'll take it. Yeah, he looks really good out there. One thing I like to watch, Bert, uh, and it's not always a true indicator, but I like to watch a guy's facial expressions. Uh, Patrick Corbin looks very relaxed. There's no tension in his face. He's not squinting. He's not grinding his teeth. He just looks very relaxed, very confident out there on the mound tonight. And there against Zach Kozart, the red shortstop, who fouls one down the left field line. Uh, you, you forget, too, yes, he's only 23 years old, Pat Corbin, but he did throw 107 major league innings last year. So he's got that under his belt. That's a base from which he can build. Absolutely. And part of that experience wasn't real good, which is also very important. You have to learn how to fail at the major league level and come back your next time out and be better. There's Charles Nagy. We'll talk to Charles coming up in the home half of the fifth year as we get ready for opening day. Get his thoughts on what he's seen tonight from Pat Corbin. Yeah, you can see Charlie Nagy's very excited about what he's seen tonight from Patrick Corbin. You talk about no expression. <laughs> you, you don't know whether he's got four aces or, uh, you know, a handful of garbage. That's a game face. Yep. Former UConn Husky. I think he's got something in his eye. Yeah. Pat Corbin, 1-2 now to Zach Cozart as we start the fifth. Did he go? Yes, he did. That is the sixth strikeout for Pat Corbin here tonight. That back foot slider appeared to start on the inside part of the plate. Looked like it was going to be in the strike zone. Cozart started his bat. Bottom just fell out of the pitch. Ugly check swing. Devin Mezzarocco, the catcher. Flying out to right his first time up. Corbin misses outside, 1-0. Miserocco this spring, 13 for 41 now. He's had an excellent spring. And he's going to be the backup catcher this year. Ryan Hannigan is going to start. Hannigan, a far superior defensive catcher at this point in their respective careers. And uh, Hannigan, a very good situational hitter. Probably won't put up the same kind of offensive numbers uh, that Devin Mezzarocco will someday, but uh, Ryan Hannigan is a guy that Dusty Baker loves to play hit and run with if there's guys on base. Very adept at hitting behind runners on base. Good bunner, and really handles this Reds pitching staff extremely well. And Mezzarocco, it, it's good because they have Hannigan, and he can hold down the fort defensively while they groom Mezzarocco, who's on all likelihood the future at the position there, 24 years old. First round pick in 2007. He was the 15th player taken overall that year. But last year, Mezzarocco started 48 games as a 23-year-old rookie. Grand scheme of things, he really went backwards last season after a promising full-year AAA in 2011. Well, I mentioned it about Patrick Corbin. Same thing goes for a guy like Devin Mezzarocco. Uh, it's a valuable lesson to learn how to struggle and learn how to fail at the big league level. And Talking to bench coach Chris Spire for the Reds before the ball game about Mezzarocco and said he just got underwater last year. He lost all of his confidence defensively and offensively, felt like he was overmatched. There you see Chris Spire. But a uh, much different guy this spring. Came in with a lot more confidence, has put together some good numbers down here in the Cactus League. They think he's going to be a real good one. Yeah, he's their future at catcher for sure. 6'1, 229, 24 years old from. Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. Arroyo showing bunt. Corners crash for the D-backs, and it's fouled off. I can't see Chris Spire, BB, without seeing that great Expos uniform. I know he was a giant everything else, but to me, Chris Spire, that number four, the mustache, Montreal Expos all the way. Well, I go back to the Giants days. We were teammates, so that's how I remember Chris Spire, but uh, certainly I remember those Expos uniforms. I still think those are the best baseball uniforms of all time. The tricolor hat. Oh, they're awesome. <laughs> I mean, it, it was a classic great look. And it, 
I don't like so much the 80s Expos ones. I go back to the early 70s, the Rusty Staub, Pepe Mangual, Coco LeBoy mm. Expos. That, that's a classic look. And Chris Beyer wore that uniform for a long time very well. 0-1 now, Arroyo drops it down, foul, and now he's 0-2 here. Does it drive you crazy, BB, in the dugout when you're, you say to your guy, and you got a veteran pitcher up there, look, just drop down a bunt, and it just, for whatever reason, doesn't work out. Well, you know, especially for a guy like Bronson Arroyo, who's yeah. very adept at getting sack bunts down. It's what he's done his whole career in the National League. He knows how to get down a bunt, and uh, it's not like Patrick Corbin is trying to trick him out there. He wants to throw a strike. Go ahead and bunt. We'll take the out. They're giving you the out. Take yeah, it. Yeah, take it. Swing it away. Fouls it over the first base dugout. There's the sign from Dusty Baker. Dusty's always been about the, the sweatbands and the wristbands, and oh, you've yeah. got the toothpick in there. He'll have four or five, six sweatbands on. There it is. He's got the wrist bracelets now. What's this? What's that the sign for? <laughs> I give up. He might be getting some strategic <laughs> advice from, from the front row back there, yeah. I think he's had enough. 0-2 oh, one more time. Swing and a miss. Struck him out. That's his seventh strikeout for Pat Corbin. Monday, spend your day with the D-backs in Fox Sports Arizona. Coverage begins at 2 o'clock with the Cactus League Weekly, followed by the March 5th telecast of Mexico National Team versus the D-backs, and then stay tuned at 6 o'clock. Opening day broadcast of the D-backs 2013 season. They'll take on the St. Louis Cardinals. Don't miss all day with the Diamondbacks. That's Monday right here on Fox Sports Arizona. Shinsu Chu steps in. He has struck out and lined out 0 for 2. Yeah, guys, the Cardinals are getting into town early, I heard, and this Where? guy's ahead of, the, yeah. uh, ahead of the field. Well, have fun now, buddy, because next week it's not going to be so much fun. It's on. Corbin has done a nice job against Chu tonight, pounding him inside with that fastball, trying to get him to speed that bat up, and he'll be much more susceptible to that breaking pitch and off-speed pitch. And this is a... As we mentioned, with the exception of Brandon Phillips, you don't think of Hannigan as an offensive player, but and he's not in the lineup either. But this is the Reds' lineup here. This is the A team. This is not a, a game in, against the B team of the backfields for Pat Corbin. He's getting it done here against uh, the lineup that will likely start opening day for the team that most think will win the NL Central. And do it with big-time offense, too. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, this Reds' offense, you, you just don't have much wiggle room. You can't make too many mistakes, especially to the guys at the top and middle of the order. Yeah, and in that ballpark, as you mentioned, they got some thumpers in this lineup. And Shoe's a really nice addition, too. It, he's always been an underrated player in Cleveland, I thought. And they're very confident about his move to center field from right field. They, they don't worry about it at all. They've been consistent on that all spring. They think he can do it. I have no doubts he can do it. I don't think he can do it at the same level that Drew Stubbs did defensively in center field. One of the premier defenders in the National League. Tremendous speed, tremendous throwing arm, but tremendously inconsistent at the plate. Struck out way too many times, and Chu is a... Uh, the exact opposite of that. He's going to get on base a lot more than Stubbs did. Little chopper, first base side. Goldschmidt has it. He'll take it himself. And that's the fifth. Patrick Corbin looking very good. Will he be on the opening day roster? He's got seven strikeouts through five.
has given up only two hits. He has struck out seven Cincinnati Reds. And with us now is his pitching coach, Charles Nagy. Charles, I'm going to guess here that you're liking what you're seeing tonight from Pat Corbin. Yeah, yeah Pat's throwing the ball really well tonight. He's throwing the ball well all spring for us and, uh, you know, happy for him. How much of a difference, Charles, do you think it made for Patrick to throw 100-plus innings at the big league level last year? Uh, it made a huge difference. He called him up earlier on in the season and, uh, you know, he struggled a little bit, sent him back down, he came back, and he, he knew what he had to do. He, knew, he learned a lot from his first time up, and he just looked more comfortable out there. He knew he had to throw his breaking ball for strikes better, and uh, he did that when he came back up the second time, and he, uh, he threw the ball really well for us. As a pitching coach, Charlie, I wonder what you think as you watch a guy like Bronson Arroyo. I mean, uh, obviously <laughs> doesn't have the velocity that he once did, but uh, has figured out how to get big league hitters out with less than his best stuff. Yeah, he's a, a good guy to uh, when you when you talk about pitching to uh, bring up to the younger kids who throw the ball hard and they just think harder, harder, harder. And he's just uh, one of those guys who's been around for a while and just hitting your spots, hitting your spots and movement and uh, hitters will get themselves out. Is that harder to do, Charles, in this era of the radar gun? Because it, it's always been lately about the numbers. What does he throw? 95, 96. How, how do you get that message through to guys that have watched radar guns here the last few years? It just comes over time uh, with experience and being out there and, um, you know, just learning yourself and learning the hitters and being comfortable. I mean, Bronson goes out there. He's, you know, you got to be very confident to do what he does. So, Charlie, we were talking to Ian Kennedy earlier, and I mentioned the fact that uh, oh, yeah. that ball's crushed. Jason Kubel, and he has got a home run. Jason Kubel is second of the spring, one nothing D-backs. That's good to see right there. And don't forget, every time a Diamondbacks player hits a home run this season, Fulton Holmes donates $150 to the Central Arizona Mountain Rescue Association. And it, BB, it's been a long spring for Jason Kubel, and boy, did he need that. Yeah, and what better time to get hot with a power swing than uh, right at the end of spring training? That ball was in the air for a long time. <laughs> Bronson Arroyo tries to come inside with something really soft. Kubel is all over it, gets a barrel on the ball, lofts it toward that right center field fence, and easily gets it out of here. Just to finish that thought, I was talking to Ian Kennedy about what a tight fraternity. Uh, especially starting pitchers, talking about opposing hitters and how do you get this guy out, how do you get that guy out, how do you grip your curveball. Uh, who was somebody in your career, whether it be a pitching coach or, or maybe a teammate, that you used to talk a lot about pitching? Uh, coming up, I was very fortunate, Oral Hershiser, Dennis Martinez in, uh, in the 90s over there with the Indians and just watching them and wow. not only how they pitched but how they went about their business. And, uh, you know, they've pitched in the big leagues a long time, and when I caught them, they were – you know, 13, 14 years into it, and just uh, you learn a lot right there. Just uh, the hard work and the dedication that it takes, and the, the preparation that it that you need to do to uh, pitch that long in the big leagues. Yeah, I used to work with Oral at, over at ESPN. <laughs> it, it, he's such an intellectual guy, and so funny and so articulate. It's amazing to sit down and just talk pitching with Oral Hershiser. I used to think he made some of that stuff up. <laughs> you do walk away going, "What did he say? It yeah. sounded smart." Exactly. <laughs> But, no, Oral's a great guy. He helped me out uh, a ton. I had some shoulder issues, too, early on in, uh, in my career. And just uh, getting on his uh, routine, his shoulder program, it, it, it was, you know, I, I don't think I could have pitched as long as I did without, without that either. Charles, it's been a, a busy offseason for pitchers, and, and it's certainly a, a very lucrative one. It started with <laughs> Zach Greinke getting all that money from the Dodgers, $140 million or so. Then Felix Hernandez got 175 And now today, Justin Verlander bumped it up to 180 and maybe Kershaw will break 200. Uh, it's possible. I mean, there's a lot of money out there uh, nowadays with all the TV contracts. So clubs are uh, not afraid to spend right now. Make what do you think about making a comeback? <laughs> <laughs> After tonight watching this, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think so. You could probably do what Bronson Arroyo is doing, yeah. No, I could. Uh, I, I just I have fun enough throwing BP to these guys. That's fun <laughs> for me. That's as far as I'll go. Charlie, how are you with where the rotation, and I, I mean 1 through 12, really, not just the five starters, but where this pitching staff is heading into uh, opening day? Good. Everybody's healthy. They're throwing the ball well. Everybody's uh, just ready to go, and uh, that's one of the biggest things in spring training, just making sure the guys get their work in and they come out uh, ready to go. Cliff Pennington lines a base hit to right. Charles Nagy, Charles, thanks very much. We enjoyed it, and we'll see you on opening day. Look forward to it. Thanks, guys. Charles Nagy, he's got an exciting job, B.B., with all these young arms the D-backs have. Pennington lines a single. He hit into a double play earlier, so that's the second hit of the inning for the Diamondbacks. And here's Pat Corbin. As you can see, they're busily readying all their preparations in the bullpen. Guys ready to leap up there at a moment's notice and jump right into action.
just keep that heart rate slow <laughs> right now. You, know, you don't want to get it going too soon. Corbin drops down a bunt. Votto thought about second, goes over to first, and Pennington moves up. I'll tell you, Joey Votto is one of the better defenders in the National League at first base. He's worked very hard on his defense, but this manager has to be holding his breath over in that first base dugout on occasion because Joey Votto will throw some of the most awkward off-balance tosses around the infield, but they always seem to be right where they need to be. Doesn't take the time to reset his feet, fading away from his target, a sidearm flip on to Donald at first base for the easy out. Nerve-wracking. So a chance here to pick up another run. There's Cliff Pennington on second base with two outs in scoring position for Gerardo Parra, who has twice flied out to center field tonight. Gerardo stepping in 0 for 2, 17 for 55 on the spring. First pitch swing and right to Joey Votto. He didn't even have to move perfectly positioned. And that's the inning. But the Diamondbacks get two hits. They leave one. Jason Kubel. He slumped this spring six for 41 before that moonshot into the seats in right field. One nothing D-backs through five. Diamondbacks lead the Reds 1-0 in the top of the sixth. Hey, in three days, the D-backs begin their 2013 season and will be ready to take on the Cardinals. The Diamondbacks opening day coverage begins Monday, April 1st, 6 o'clock, a special one-hour Diamondbacks live pregame show right here on Fox Sports Arizona. Opening night, BB. We are getting ready for opening night. And good test right out of the shoot, too. St. Louis Cardinals uh, expected to compete in that National League Central Division as that one's lofted into center field. No problem. One easy out. Yeah, I was checking the Reds schedule uh, the other day. Their first month of the season, with the exception of the Angels, to open for three games. Uh, their first month is relatively easy. Their last month of the season should be relatively easy. Uh, the Reds are going to be as good as Dusty Baker and his staff think they are. Uh, they got a very favorable early season and late season schedule. Well, I, you know, I was looking at that, too. 18 of their first 28 are against teams that were over 500 last year. They open uh, up at home against the Angels. How weird is that in this new era of interleague play? Get used to that. It where it will be cold. Yeah. Yes, it will be cold in Cincinnati. What did Marty tell us? Uh, temperature in the mid-40s. Uh, <laughs> Rain turning to snow. Oh, lovely day for a ball game. Dusty's made a wholesale changes here, as you can see. So we're and, and BB is and why why stop now? Let's do them all at once. So he's on that same plan. There's Dusty.
Pat Corbin cruising along here. Two quick outs in the sixth. So here's Xavier Paul. He'll hit for Ludwig. And as they say in the trade, BB, all these changes are straight up. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Just, I got my fingers crossed. <laughs> Xavier Paul, last season 314, two homers, seven RBIs in 55 games. His first season in Cincinnati. He's hitting in Ryan Ludwig's cleanup spot. And he's become a valuable guy for them, playing either corner outfield position. Chopper to first. And there's Paul Goldschmidt. So Pat Corbin cruising here through six innings. He's given up only two hits with seven strikeouts. one nothing d -backs. Arizona Diamondbacks baseball is brought to you in part by Sanderson Ford, Arizona's largest Ford dealership. Gila River, proud partner of the Arizona Diamondbacks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye, Hey, Snacks. We're back here. Bottom six. D-backs lead the Reds. one nothing. Jason Kubel of solo shot to lead off the fifth against Bronson Arroyo, the only run of the game so far. And Pat Corbin is pitching a gem. He's gone through six, given up two hits with seven strikeouts. And uh, BB, it doesn't seem like there's any doubt now. I wouldn't think so. I mean, unless uh, something crops up between now and tomorrow. But uh, Patrick Corbin has answered every question that the Diamondback staff may have had about him. Pitched with a lot of poise tonight. Pitched off of his fastball. Used it on both sides of the plate. Mixed in just enough off-speed pitches and breaking balls to keep the Reds off balance. Really looked good tonight. Martin Prado leads off the Arizona sixth. Prado, Hill, Montero, two, three, and four. Martin has rounded out and singled. And we have a, a host of defensive changes for Dusty Baker. There's that little 66 mile an hour <laughs> floater that just drops in. Well, that takes a lot of guts to throw a pitch like that to a major league hitter. That Bronson really Royal has never been short on guts. Guts and guile, that's what it takes sometimes. Well, then you can back it up with 86, so you've you've got the 20-mile-an-hour difference. And the 86 looks like 106 that's after you've seen that slow breaking ball. Exactly. And think about Arroyo, too. Is such a variance in velocities in his pitches. You see there the high of 88, a low of 63 tonight. He does it all out of the same delivery. Some guys will have to slow their arm down a little bit to throw that slow curve ball, but Bronson Arroyo really disguises all of his pitches well, even when he floats a 73-mile-an-hour fastball in there. Low of 63 sounds like a weather report. <laughs> his 87-mile-an-hour average fastball last year, fifth slowest in the major leagues. And he only throws the fastball 38% of the time. That's the fourth least of any starter in baseball. And as we've seen in the game here tonight, he rarely throws it for a strike. He'll elevate the fastball. He'll try to lead you off the outside corner or push you off the plate with it. Jack Hanahan has come on to play third with a nice barehanded stop, and he throws him out. They used to call him Super Manahan in Cleveland. Now he's a red. 
And one of the many defensive changes here for those teams. Boy, that's an outstanding defensive play. You see, initially cradled that ball back into the palm of his hand, was able to get it out to his fingertips before making that all-in-one throw across the diamond right on the money for the out, and Prado almost beat that one. He's a valuable guy, Jack Ann, and they gave him a two-year deal, and he's the man in the infield. He's that extra infielder that can play all the spots and really bail you out. Defensively, as Aaron Hill steps in for the Reds, it's a whole new look out there. Mike Hessman, the former Mets great, is at first. There's Mike. Cesar Turris is the new second baseman. Emmanuel Burris is at short. We saw Jack Hanahan at third. In the outfield, there's Xavier Paul. He's in left. Chris Heisey is the new center fielder. And Felix Perez is in right. Conrad Schmidt behind the plate. So Dusty has changed everyone except for Bronson Arroyo. Aaron Hill fouls it down the left field line. There's Conrad Schmidt, former Diamondback rate. Aaron Hill is grounded out and flied out. 19 for 49 now on the spring for Aaron. Here's the 0-2. Excuse me, foul. Conrad Schmidt has that extra eight layer of padding there uh, on the chin strap of his uh, of his mask. He's got that uh, Fu Manchu mustache, a thick one as well. A little it's extra a padding in case he takes a foul tip off the mask. Now, would you recommend that as a former catcher? Hey, I'm telling you what, I'd look like Duck Dynasty now if I was back there <laughs> behind a plate. The more padding I can get between me and that baseball, the better. And if it happens to be facial hair, so be it. You would be then the most popular man in the major leagues because... <laughs> As Aaron Hill lines a base hit to left. I honestly don't think there's a major league player that doesn't watch Duck Dynasty. It's amazing. Uh, they are infatuated with those guys. In fact, I noticed in some of the gift baskets, all the all d backs wives last night put together gift baskets that were part of the silent auction for evening on the diamond. And no kidding around, almost everybody's gift basket included a DVD set of the entire season <laughs> of Duck Dynasty. Uh, they watch it religiously. Josh Colmenter's a big fan. Yeah, well, uh, Josh really trimmed it up, though. Yeah, I mean, he did. He looked like uh, the man on the mountain about halfway Ooh. through camp. But he got his uh, beard into opening day shape. Yeah, well, they'd give him a month or so, and he'll be right back there with the boys calling the ducks. Quack. Miguel Montero now. In the air to left, Xavier Paul coming in. They rule it a catch. And Aaron Hill has to hustle back to first base. Xavier Paul charging in, made a nice grab. They really like him as their guy on either corner off the bench. Did a nice job as a pinch hitter for Dusty Baker last year as well. Had a long way to go to get to that ball, playing deep for Miguel Montero, who's got good power the opposite way, but Paul with a nice sliding catch, then fired back to the infield to try to double Aaron Hill off first base. And you mentioned as a pinch hitter, BB, what a bat to have on your bench. Last year, Xavier Paul, 12 for 36 as a pinch hitter. Here's Goldie. Paul Goldschmidt has flied to right and popped up to short. He's 0 for 2. Now 24 for 60 on the spring. Let's go downstairs to Brad, who has more on Paul Goldschmidt. Brad. Well, thanks, guys. A lot of uh, reports that Paul Goldschmidt about ready to ink as he drives the ball to the center field for the base hit. About to ink a five-year contract extension with the D-backs for $32 million. Nothing official just yet, but today a lot of reporter, reporters gathered around Paul as he was trying his best not to tip his hand and, and talk about it. But Miguel Montero walked by and said, oh, talk to the man with all the money. And they got a good chuckle out of that. But uh, we hope to get that news in the next couple of days. But, you know, that files under the uh, takes one to know one last year Miguel Montero got that contract extension I think it says a lot about this franchise guys that work hard and epitomize what the D-backs way is all about they're rewarded and it looks like uh, Goldie is going to uh, get that reward here in the next couple of days yeah last year Miggy five years 60 million so what's he talking about money wise 
I mean, Miggy's in pretty good shape himself. Yeah, he's, he's got the red Ferrari. I don't think Goldie has that yet, so. Uh, and, and by the way, have you seen Miggy when he drives down that the Via Ventura when he's showing up to Salt River? Yes, <laughs> that little, I have. That little back road that's kind of like a drag strip? A lot like a drag strip. Yeah, it, and he almost uses it as one. He likes to hear that engine whine as he pulls in to show up for work every day. That's about the only safe place you can uh, redline that car. <laughs> That's the only place that we would recommend, and <laughs> often not even there, in fact. Here's Kubel, homer his last time up. Yeah, Miguel Montero drives a very flashy, uh, he's got a very flashy ride, as the kids say. Mm -hmm. Or whip. Is it still a whip? Do they still say whip? Yeah. Nice whip. Let's take a look, BB, at Jason Kubel last inning. Hasn't been a lot of offense in this game. Both pitchers on top of their game tonight, but Jason Kubel takes advantage of a hanging off-speed pitch on the inside part of the plate. Bangs it over that 376 mark in right center field for the only score in the ballgame. That's what you call a hanging nothing ball. And that's so great to see. I mean, if you had to pick one guy tonight, that you would want to see do something with a home run is Jason Kubel because he has battled the knee off and on all spring long. It's been tough for him to get going. There was an ankle issue this week as well, but he looks good tonight, certainly. Well, and, and inevitably, some self-doubt creeps in. You know, where did my power go? Is it my knee? Is it my ankle? Uh, did I change my swing? Am I doing something different? Where is the power gone? But uh, the Jack one out of here in the, the next to the last exhibition game of the spring has to feel really good for Jason. And the only reason you were concerned about it was because of his first and second half splits last year as he fouls another one off. Kubel, first half of last season, hit 293 with 60 RBIs. After the All-Star break, hit 201 with 30 RBIs. Through the end of July, he was hitting 290, but his average dropped 47 points over his final 193 at-bats. And you were a little worried about carryover into this season. Watching him struggle a bit, knowing that he's battling the knee, battling the ankle, and the two are related, he says. It's, it's a nerve issue. We had a significant knee surgery back in 2004, and sometimes when he bangs the knee, oddly enough, he feels it in the ankle. Says the two are, have often been connected ever since the surgery. Yeah, the knee bone is connected to the shin bone, and the <laughs> shin bone is connected to the ankle bone, so it makes sense. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> and the D-backs, we know, with all the uh, outfield injuries with Adam Eaton and Cody Ross opening the season on the DL. We heard Kirk Gibson say earlier today that Cody will open the season on the DL. They, they need Jason Kubel. They need him anyway for his, his power back from the left-hand side. And he's got a tremendous at-bat work in here against Bronson Arroyo. This will be the 11th pitch of the at-bat. That's also a terrific sign. Well, that's something I think the Diamondbacks offense uh, as a unit is going to do much better this year. Work some counts, run up some pitch counts on those opposing starters, get into that soft underbelly of every major league team, long relief. Martin Prado, a guy who's among the league leaders every year in pitches per plate appearance. Jason Kubel having a great at bat here. A lot of guys in this lineup that can work counts, force that pitcher to throw a lot of pitches to either get him out or get him on. Kubel to center field. It throws Heisey for a second. But he comes in and makes the catch. Diamondbacks get two hits. They leave two. We're through six. one nothing D-backs.
Diamondbacks lead the Reds 1-0 here in the seventh inning. Hey, subscribe to MLB.TV Premium today and watch over 150 select spring training games live online or on the go. You can watch every regular season game live or on demand on over 250 mobile and connected devices. Monthly packages are available. You guys watching the game right now. Visit dbacks.com for details. Gibby, he did it to us again. Yeah. He's changed uh, everybody, including the pitcher. Here's Brad Ziegler. And what a huge, huge night it was for Pat Corbin. Outstanding performance by Patrick Corbin tonight. Not only good stuff, worked his way through this Reds uh, potent lineup rather easily tonight, but uh, did it with a lot of poise and a lot of confidence, which is, I'm sure, what Charlie Nagy was looking for. So here's Brad Ziegler last year, 77 appearances. He is the man. You get in trouble, you call Brad Ziegler and get you out of it. And we got a whole bunch of changes defensively for the D-backs, and we'll get them to you as soon as we have them. That's Tuffy Ghost, which yep, I know so. that. You can tell because the name extends all the way to the back shoulder. There's a base hit for Perez. Leads it off in the seventh against Brad Ziegler. All right, let's run through it. Eric Hinsky's at first base. He's replacing Paul Goldschmidt. Josh Wilson, second base. Third baseman. <laughs> yeah, he's over there. <laughs> All right, so Hanahan up now with a man on against Brad Ziegler. Now, we do have the lineup boards here, Steve. I, I know you've noticed them in right center and left center. Each team's lineup is posted yes, out there. But and sadly, can... as you can see, it, it in no way represents the current time. No, <laughs> they haven't quite caught up with the team on the field right now. Yeah, we'll just... We'll hope for the best and say Matt Davidson looks good over there. Other than that, we'll let you know. We'll get back to you. Hanahan way out in front. There's the changeup from Brad Ziegler, and that's really, B.B., the pitch that he's worked on all spring long, the changeup. He's going to throw it, he says, more this year, perhaps more even than his slider. It's become a strikeout pitch for Brad, and it's really, really been effective this spring. And it's all about the arm speed. It looks exactly like that two-seam sinking fastball that he throws from that sidearm delivery, but uh, about 8 to 10 miles per hour slower. And it's funny, Brad has gone back to using the same grips that he threw when he threw overhand. So he's got the two-seam fastball grip, but he's using his old grip, and he's using his old change-up grip now. Back from the days when he actually, had, there was a point in time where Brad Ziegler did throw overhand. He's used the same grips now with his other motion, and he really, really likes it. Very comfortable. Here's the 2-1 now to Hanahan. There goes Perez. Play was on. Not in time at first, at second. They get the out at first. Davidson. They get the out at first, but Perez moves up. A good presence of mind by Josh Wilson. A little too slow to get the runner who was in motion as that pitch was delivered. You see he slides in safely, but Wilson realizes he still has a chance to get the batter at first base. Diamondbacks get it out on the play. Wilson at second. Nick Ahmed at short now. Davidson at third as we showed you. There's Nick, Yukon Husky, just like Charles Nagy. Emmanuel Burris up for the Reds. Round ball to first. Hinsky charging, flips to Brad Ziegler. And it's in time. Perez moves to third, two down. Ziegler falls off to that third base side just a little bit because of the sidearm delivery, but recovers, gets over there and covers the bag quickly, immediately checks that runner at third base. Textbook play right there. That's one of the first drills that teams work on in spring training. Ground balls to the right side. Pitcher getting over to first base to cover. Conrad Schmidt is up now. Here's the new outfield for the D-backs. It's Alfredo Marte in left, Tony Campana in center, and Socrates Brito is in right field. You're, glad, by the way, to, you're glad to see him. Tell me that Socrates Brito is not the best name in baseball That's right pretty now. good. I mean, Socrates Brito. I mean, that's just getting it done right there. And we've seen a lot of Socrates this spring, too. It's looked good. Conrad Schmidt will see if Ziegler can strand this runner a third here with two outs in a one nothing game. Hit him. Now 
Now playing 19. right field, number 19. See, this is what it's like to broadcast <laughs> a game in spring training. And even when you're you're this close, BB, we're right at the finish line here. And playing center field is number 19, and playing right field is number 19. There was a, we did a game, what was it, Tuesday night against the Angels, and they had three number 12s mm. with no names on the back. That was fun. <laughs> 12A, 12B, 12C. One, one of the above. Henry Rodriguez steps in now. He's batting in the pitcher's spot here. First and third, two outs for Brad Ziegler. He's given up a single and he's hit a batter. He's ahead here, 0-1. Rodriguez lines the base in and the right, that ties the game. Schmidt stops at second, a run in for the Reds. Occasionally with that sidearm delivery, you get so much movement that the ball ends up where you don't want it. That time Ziegler trying to go inside with the fastball, but the tailing action brought it back over the inside part of the plate where Rodriguez was able to get the barrel of the bat on it and tie this one up. Top of the order now, here's Chris Heisey. He came in to play center field for Shinsu Chu. First and second now, two down. Drops it in there for a strike. Chris Heisey last year, 265, seven homers and 31 RBIs in 120 games. And the thing they love about Chris Heisey is he can play anywhere, all three outfield spots. Made 80 starts playing all three spots last year. So with Heisey and Paul on their bench, Dusty Baker in really good shape in terms of outfield subs. Brown ball on that. The force to Wilson, the Diamondbacks are out of the inning. But the Reds get two hits. They tie it up. We'll go bottom seven, 1-1. One, one. Easter weekend to Chase Field. Reds and Diamondbacks 1-1 one, one as we go to the bottom of the seventh. Sing the take me out to the ball game. Seventh inning stretch time. Steve Perkinbach, Brenly along the way. Joined up here in the booth by Joe Borowski. And I know you've got to be excited about what we saw from Pat Corbin today. I'll tell you what. What he did right there, if that doesn't solidify <laughs> him earning the fifth starter spot, I don't know what will. He sure looked good. What did you see? That What worked so well? You know what I was impressed by him tonight was his ability to locate inside with his fastball. I thought that set up the rest of his game, and I thought he used his breaking ball very effectively. His changeup that he's been working on was very good, but I thought he was able to locate his fastball, and that sets up the rest of his game. And you just see there's a confidence about him out on the mound right now. And coming up late last year, you know, there were some games where he struggled a little bit, and you wondered if the confidence was waning a little bit. But tonight, I don't think there was any doubt. I mean, obviously the stuff, Joe, tonight was really good. Sure. You mentioned that fastball on both sides of the plate, but uh, I agree with you. I think the thing that impressed me the most was just his poise. Yeah. He was relaxed. He was clear. He was very confident that uh, he could execute his pitches and get these hitters out. 
JJ you know, Hoover, the new Reds pitcher. I'm sorry. And you know very well that the more experience you have up here, and when you get have success at this level, that's when the confidence starts to exude, and you start to see it on the mound. And you talk about mound presence, and you see, and that's what he had tonight. Last year, he's still trying to find his way, seeing if he fit in. And then he came in this year. He's battling for the fifth starter job in spring training. And he kind of took the bull by the horns, and, and you saw it out there today. He was just confident that he's the man. He earned the spot, and he wasn't going to let it go. Here's Alfredo Marte, who came into the game to play left field. And, or pardon, yeah, this is a guy. Wow, he's really shown some pop here the last week of camp. And now, Joe, he's in the discussion sure. maybe for a fourth outfielder spot on the opening day roster. Yeah, usually, uh, and Bob, you know better than anyone, usually around this time in spring, you're looking at, well, I got my roster set. I know what I'm going to do, but with all the rash of injuries, Gibby's still got some question marks going out there. Yeah, some question marks, but the good thing is he, he's got some potential answers. Yeah. I know a lot of ball clubs, uh, if they suffer injuries this late in spring training, they're in deep sure trouble so. going into the regular season. But I think Gibby feels like they've got enough personnel, enough guys to uh, to keep their heads above water until they get their full complement of players back. And there's another guy, too, I think that you might – just have the conversation about the guy we're going to see hit here next, Nick Ahmed, as Dusty Baker comes out to take the ball from J.J. Hoover. And I think it's going to be sort of <laughs> they're having a good time out there. Okay, you did a great job. You got my one guy. <laughs> going to make sure everybody gets some work in here. Here comes Araldus Chapman. Well, what a difference this will be from Bronson Arroyo back after this. <laughs> Here should Araldus Chapman start games or finish them? And the thought, Joe Borowski, by some, and that includes pitching coach Brian Price, was that, you know, we've got this guy, Chapman, and by the way, he just turned 25. If he's ever going to be Randy Johnson, we need to find out now. We need to give him the chance to find out. They started that way, and then halfway through camp, Chapman said, I don't want to do this. I want to close. Now he's the closer. What do you think? I understand what the Reds organization is thinking. Why not have this guy every fifth day? pitching seven or eight innings and just instead of just the one inning but my thoughts are why not have that dominant guy you bring in in the ninth and when you have the lead sign seal delivered it's over i think he's more valuable to this team as a closer simply throwing 100 miles an hour instead of trying to have him average 95 96 through seven or eight innings because i don't know if many people that are going to be able to sustain 100 miles an hour for seven innings, 100 pitches. So I think this is the best fit for him. I agree with you. There are closers, but this guy's a weapon. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. he's not just a closer. This guy, the numbers he put up last year were, were just out of this world. Yeah. Well, there are times late in a ball game where contact yeah, sure. alone will cause you to lose sure. the ball game, and this is a guy that can miss bats just by throwing the ball right through the wood. And explosive fastball. And what you like to hear from Chapman is, first of all, he stepped up and said, and this was unsolicited too, hey, I want to be the closer. And they were still debating, you yeah. know, in the back rooms there in Red's front office and everything. And he came out and said, I want to be the closer. And he said, I really have grown to like 
the adrenaline rush. I like being out there in that situation. And Joe, like I it. imagine that's what you want to hear. There's nothing if like you're Dusty it. Baker or Walsh Ockety. If you're a relief pitcher, I, I think your ultimate goal is is to be at the end of the game to close those games because I, I was fortunate enough to do it, and there's nothing like it. It's it's just the game is in your hands, and and you don't want to let your teammates down. It's just that I think for relief pitchers, it's the ultimate, and and when you have an arm like that. I think you're perfectly suited for it. And, and he's really, he's grabbed the reins and he's gone with it. Last year was just absolutely dominant. And I, I think the fact that he would rather close than start tells you that he's not a golfer. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Chavez takes a big swing with his driver and misses. We're through seven now. Here's another look. Gas. Mm. Joe Borowski, Joe, we'll look for you at the end of the game. Thanks. Looking forward to it. Reds and D-backs tied 1-1 through 7. to you in part by Taco Bell. Sometimes you just gotta live Moss. Chaz Roberts, choose Chaz. Scorpions outside Chase Field. Sometimes, as uh, members of our crew learned last night, they're in the house. Ooh. Araldus Chapman, taking a look at Araldus Chapman in the Reds dugout. And he just showed why he wants to be the closer. Come in, get the strikeout. We're done. Yeah, it looks like they're uh, looking at his hand, possibly. Uh, or his wrist. Or his wrist, maybe. Uh, probably has blisters from the heat on that fastball he was throwing. New pitcher for the Diamondbacks is the left-hander, Tony Sipp. Cesar's tourist pops him up. First base side here. Kinski overruns it. Last peek up right uh, there by Eric Hinsky. He took a look to see where the railing was and where he was in relation to the railing. And when he looked back up, he realized he misgaged the fly ball. Just misses. And the panels are open here, too. The roof is open and the panels are open. And that when something hit that high, that may change things as well. You know, we heard Ian Kennedy say you could feel a little bit of a breeze down at yeah. field level. Certainly, we don't feel it up here in the press box, but maybe just enough to alter the flight of that pop-up. Tony Sipp drops a strike in there. The pride of Pascagoula, Mississippi. Former Cleveland India now here with the Diamondbacks. Last year, 1-2, a 4-4-2 ERA and 63 appearances. 55 innings, 51 strikeouts. His tourist skies another one up there. Josh Wilson gets a chance. Here's Tony Sipp last season in Cleveland. 63 appearances, the 4-4-2 ERA. 
See the 63 appearances last year that followed 69 in the 2011 season and 70 appearances back in 2010 for the tribe. Yeah, we mentioned the workload that uh, Brad Ziegler had put in. Tony Sip has been the same over in the American League. Here's Mike Hessman. Hessman lines one down the left field line. Between 2010 and 2012, no American League left-hander appeared in more games than Tony Sip in Cleveland. He answered the call, as B.B. mentioned, 202 times over the last three years with the Tribe. And over that same span, only Scott Downs and Matt Thornton had more holds among AL lefties than Tony Sipp's 51. Last year, lefties hit 209 against him. And Kevin Towers had been consistent this spring, B.B., in talking about the two new lefties here to go along with Joe Patterson at the bullpen. Matt Reynolds and Tony Sipp. Reynolds, not your typical left-hand guy. He can really go give you, earlier in the game, give you the full inning. Where Tony Sipp may come in a bit later, and he's what's known now as a loogie, which is lefty one-out guy. Come in, get the lefty, and you're done. And it's tremendous to have those options. A couple of guys that can come in and get out a tough left-hander, or battle against a tough right-hander if necessary late in a ball game. This gives you a little more flexibility. You may have an at-bat in the sixth inning where you've got a tough lefty up at the plate, Andre Ethier or whoever it may be. You'd like to have a left-handed pitcher available to face him in that situation, but you know he's going to roll back around again later in the game. And this year, Gibby will have that second lefty available if necessary. Yeah, because last year it was all Joe Paw out there, Joe Patterson. And there's Joe. He was the, the lone lefty back there, and so that was clearly something that had to be addressed, and Kevin Towers did so this winter. Uh, going to Cleveland to get Tony Sipp and going to Colorado to get Matt Reynolds. One of the priorities that uh, KT identified. we got to strengthen the bench. We're going to get deeper in the bullpen. we got to get some lefty arms back there. And he checked uh, off his entire list this winter. Here's the 2-2 now to Mike Hessman. Tony Sipp, Pascagoula, Mississippi. Went to high school in Moss Point where he lettered in football as a defensive back on their state championship team when he was a senior. Also a letterman in baseball and tennis. He was a junior college pitcher for Okaloosa Walton on the Florida Panhandle. That's a little bit east of Pensacola. Finished his collegiate career as a Clemson Tiger and was a 45th round pick by the Indians back in 04. Gets the strikeout. Hey, get tickets now for the first weekend series at Chase Field. The D-backs and the Dodgers, April 12th through the 14th. On Saturday, April 13th, the first 20,000 fans to the 5-10 game will get a Beat LA t-shirt courtesy. <laughs> BB, you've never looked better. Courtesy of Gila River Casinos. That You're going to get this shirt. 20,000 of these were given out for that first Dodger game on that uh, Saturday, April 13th. Call 602-462-4600 or log on to D-backs. Com. And you don't have to wear it only against the Dodgers. You can make that statement any opponent. Well, I mean, like if you're if you don't like the Lakers, for instance, there they're go. they're going down the tank apparently. And you can, it applies or the Kings. I mean, take your pick. Dodgers, maybe they'll finish finish off the sequence of expensive super teams that just didn't quite work out. Xavier Paul swings and misses and see if Tony Sipp can get a 1-2-3 inning here in the eighth. Tony Sipp traded in December. He admitted to having mixed emotions because Cleveland was the only professional organization he'd known. And he said, you know, all I know is Cleveland. It's almost like leaving home for the first time. This is there. I think it's a little bit of a shock to any player the first time you're traded or changed teams uh, uh, from your draft club, the, the ball club. As Tony Sipp said, the only team he has ever known. It, it has to be a little bit of shock to the system. But the great thing about the game of baseball is there's so many built-in friendships. Uh, you know a guy who knows a guy that played with a friend of yours. And before you know it, uh, you're just part of the ball club. As they say, sometimes in baseball, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Yep. Tony said, you know what, I put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears with that organization, uh, but I got to move on. A 
but he's thrilled to be here. Loves the group. Loves the situation here with the D-backs. Ready to be ultra competitive here in the NL West as he misses outside. 29 years old. He'll turn 30 July 12th. 70, 69, and 63 appearances his last three seasons in Cleveland. He takes the ball. And each one of those seasons, there was probably another 30 or 40 games that he was warmed up in the <laughs> bullpen, ready to come in, but wasn't needed. Paul skies one. Josh Wilson wants it. A nice eighth inning there for the pride of Pascagoula, Mississippi. Tony Sip, welcome to Arizona. Hey, Snacks, it's 1-1, bottom eight. Chaz Roberts cool play. Here comes Xavier Paul for the Reds. Nice sliding catch playing extremely deep for Miguel Montero. Showed that good speed. Nice sliding catch just above the turf. And that's our Chaz Roberts cool play of the game. 1-1 one, one here in the game. Taking a bow. Xavier Paul. Tip of the cap, wag of the finger. <laughs> Got some fans out there. New pitcher for the Reds, Sam LeCure. We've seen Hoover, Chapman, and now LeCure from the Reds bullpen. He'll face Socrates Brito to lead it off here in the eighth. Brito, Davidson, Wilson for the Diamondbacks. We're back here tomorrow afternoon. Gates open at 11 a.m. at Chase Field. 12:40 first pitch. Wade Miley and Homer Bailey. Brito fouls one down the left hand side. At this point, you, I think Dusty would like to get BB all these guys, maybe one inning apiece here from his bullpen in the big league park and then move on. Yeah, just fine tune the work they've been doing down here all spring one last time. Uh, as you said, on a big league mound in a big league stadium. That's one thing Dusty's uh, pretty proud of, the, the bullpen that they've assembled there in Cincinnati. Obviously, with the Raldis Chapman at the end of it, you, you're going to like it a bunch in the ninth inning, but uh, LeCure and Sean Marshall. Yeah, and they invested big money in uh, Broxton as well. Socrates Brito, the Socratic method, up for a base hit to lead off the inning. We've seen a lot of Socrates this spring. He played rookie ball in Missoula last year. And in 69 games, he hit 312. Four homers and 39 RBI. Gets a base Davidson. hit here. Very well placed grounder back up the middle of the field. Big run in the ball game here. So he's the uh, go ahead run on. There's the bullpen. Joe Patterson is up. Joe Paw's getting busy out there. Matt Davidson steps in now. Davidson came on to play third base for Martin Prado earlier. Hey. 
They like Matt Davidson a lot. Last season of the minor leagues, 301, four homers and 35 RBIs. The question for Matt long term is, can the defense catch up to the offense? And it's not the glove per se as much in talking to Kevin Towers as it is BB the footwork for Matt at third. Is he getting himself in the proper throwing position and fielding position? Taylor made double play ball right there for Burris. Right at you, including the bats. There it is. And, you know, we've seen a little bit more of that this spring, the broken bats. That kind of went away as the, the, the quality of the maple improved. They had higher standards for the maple bats. And, you know, we saw a few years ago they were shattering all the time. Well, Major League Baseball really cracked down on some of the companies and said, hey, if these maple bats are going to be this popular, the quality of the wood has to, has to get better. And it did. And I'm not saying it's been downgraded, but we have seen more broken bats, I think, this spring than last year. Some of that could have to do with the pitching as well. Nice. <laughs> Josh Wilson. Well, you mentioned Davidson and his footwork. Uh, a lot of times the guy will make a bad throw, and it's easy to assume watching from the stands or watching from the press box, well, he's got a scatter arm. He doesn't know where he's throwing the ball, but many times it be, it's because his feet are not in the proper position. If your feet aren't where they're supposed to be, the rest of your body is not going to be where it's supposed to be, and you're really fighting against yourself to make an accurate throw. And Matt is a big guy. He's a big kid. There's a guy that did it pretty well, Matt Williams. I don't know if he ever made a bad throw. But Matt Davidson is a big physical guy, and it's a question of getting him to move the right way. And they've been very encouraged by what they've seen. Here's Josh Wilson, who in all likelihood, BB, will find himself on the opening day roster. Nothing for sure. But if you do the math, it, it sort of works out that way with some of the injuries we've had. And now Willie Bloomquist with that grade two right oblique strain on the DL. Wilson looks at strike three. That ends the eighth. We'll go to the ninth. 1-1 one, one, Reds and D-backs. We're almost there. Opening day coming up Monday. For the young left-hander, Patrick Corbin, he's our APS Energy All-Star, trying to lock down that fifth and final rotation spot, and he was spectacular. Six innings, only two hits, seven strikeouts, a pair of walks. He went 93 pitches, and uh, guys, I'd have to say it was a very emphatic statement for locking down that number five stock. We'll still have to see, but Patrick Corbin located the fastball against an A's lineup that, as you mentioned, is pretty solid top to bottom. Great stuff from the 23-year-old left-hander. And now we're looking at the uh, left-hander, Joe Patterson, on here, Brad, to start the ninth inning here of a 1-1 game. Joe Pa on, trying to stay in the mix for a bullpen spot here. And B.B. talking about Pat Corbin, the numbers here were fantastic. I mean, this is, you couldn't ask for more. But he, really, with the exception of one outing against the Royals, 
where he gave up a grand slam to Alex Gordon. Uh, Corbin has basically been very consistently effective all spring long. Uh, I still think this, however, is by far his best outing of the spring under the most trying of circumstances. He took the mound tonight knowing that if he failed, if he went out there and, uh, and really laid an egg, that uh, his chances of making this roster were going to be uh, uh, not as good as they should be. But he went out there and did exactly what he had to do with uh, uh, what pressure you can take from spring training and went out and pitched the best game of the spring. Felix Perez finds a gap. Tony Campana with that speed trying to chase it down. There goes Perez. He wants three. Here's the relay and he is in there. A triple. Felix Perez. Reds now with a go-ahead run on third. The high leg kick from Felix Perez drives that ball into the gap in left center field. Tony Campana takes way too shallow of a line to that ball and ends up chasing it all the way to the barrier in left center field. And Perez just puts his head down and motors into third base with a leadoff triple. And Jack Hanahan now a chance to give the Reds the lead. Lefty lefty matchup here for Hanahan. Patterson. Infield in. Joe Paul last year, as we mentioned, he was uh, kind of the Alamo back there when they needed a left-hander and also had 48 appearances at AAA Reno. <laughs> BB infield creeping in here. Nice stop by Tuffy Ghost, which there, and it hit him. It hit Hanahan, so now first and third. Well, Kirk Gibson knows that Dusty Baker still has a couple of pretty good arms available out of that bullpen, even though we've already seen their closer rolled as Chapman. Uh, he's got Sean Marshall and Alfredo Simon teed up and ready to go down in that bullpen. I think Kirk Gibson uh, does not want to give up another run in this game. He feels like it's going to be tough to break through against uh, the rest of the Reds bullpen, so trying to cut this one off right here. Hope that his offense can come up with a run in the bottom half. J.J. puts warming up. Emmanuel Burris up there for Cincinnati. And he looks at a ball. Perez on third, Hanahan on first here. Nobody out 1 1 in the ninth. Chopper shortstop, Ahmed thought about coming home. Clutches gets the out at first. The Reds take the lead. Maybe he thought hard about it there. It appeared he just didn't have a real good handle on that baseball as he came in and made the play on the short hop. He was thinking about going home, but right there just didn't have a good enough grip. Didn't want to risk a bad throw and put two runners into scoring position besides the run scoring. So wisely just held on and got the out at first base, even though the Reds push across the go-ahead run. So the Reds make it 2-1 here in the ninth. One out, and Conrad Schmidt is up. Hanahan moves up to second. Conrad Schmidt hit by a Brad Ziegler pitch back in the seventh. Same two teams back here tomorrow. That's the final game of spring training 2013. Chase Field. Gates open up at 11 a.m. 12.40 first pitch. And that's a big one for Wade Miley. They had to shut him down with the dead arm, so he's a little bit behind. And Kirk Gibson told us earlier they like what they've seen from Wade in terms of the health and the velocity is back. Now it's a question of fine-tuning. Davidson at third. Here comes Kirk Gibson, and I think we're going to all be thunderstruck here. Can't wait. <laughs> 
Here comes JJ. We'll take a break when we come back. That's it for Joe Patterson. Enter JJ puts D-backs trail the Reds 2-1 in the ninth. J.J. puts on in the ninth with the D-backs trailing the Reds 2-1 here with two outs. Hey, get out by the pool this year. In three days, the D-backs begin their 2013 season, and they'll be ready to take on the St. Louis Cardinals. Diamondbacks opening day coverage begins Monday, April 1st, 6 o'clock. Special one-hour Diamondbacks live pregame show right here on Fox Sports Arizona. Don't miss all the opening day festivities. One of the best days of the year. J.J. puts on for the D-backs here, trailing 2-1. JJ last year a 282 ERA. 32 saves and 37 chances. He appeared in 57 games. Worked 54 and a third innings. Here it is. JJ just had a birthday, turned 36 last month. He's in there against Christopher Negron. We mentioned, B.B., at the start of the show how the Diamondbacks have locked up most of their offensive players. They also exercised their option on J.J. Putz in October, and then in January added a $7 million salary for next season. So we signed through 2014. And that's how most teams uh, like to build a bullpen. You start with your closer and work backwards. Yeah, you get the appropriate setup guys, the eighth inning guy, the, maybe the seventh inning matchup guys, but it all starts with that closer and works backward. That yeah, Kurt Gibson said earlier this spring, there's Charles Nagy, they said when we ask people to buy into the Diamondback way and they do that, you want to keep them. You look for people like that, and they have that in J.J. Putz. He's the leader back there of that whole group. Last year, his fourth season with at least 30 saves, finished with 32. Had a career-high 45 saves two years ago. He's the first reliever in D-backs history with back-to-back 30-save -back seasons. Heath Bell looking on. That's part of the bullpen depth here, the Heath Bell experience. David Hernandez as well. You've got four closers back there, really, if you, you include... Brad Ziegler, four guys with closing experience. And there's not a lot of teams in the majors that can say that. The bullpen depth this year will be a real weapon for Kirk Gibson and Charles Nagy. Here's a 3-1. Well, another thing that depth will do, uh, Bert, ideally is possibly limit some of the innings that your starting pitchers have to throw, especially early in the season when maybe their arm strength isn't quite where you'd like it to be. When you have a uh, deep, experienced bullpen, uh, you can pull the plug on those starters a little earlier than you might normally do or a little earlier than maybe you will later in the season. It's in the dirt. Ghostwitch picks it up in front. 
Gets the out at first. And the Diamondbacks strand the run, but the Reds take a 2-1 lead. D-backs down to their final three outs. Bottom ninth coming up from Chase Field. Here at Chase Field, Reds lead the Diamondbacks 2-1. D-backs down to their final three outs here, and they'll face a new pitcher for Cincinnati, Alfredo Simon has come on. Well, we've been talking about the Diamondbacks' depth in the bullpen, and the Reds can say the same thing. Dusty Baker really used his bullpen extensively last year. Simon was a big part of that, especially at the end of the season. See his numbers from last year. So the Reds get the go ahead run on in the ninth. Perez led it off with a triple. Comes in to score. Now it's 2 1 here. Here's Tuffy Goswitch. The ASU Sun Devil steps in against Alfredo Simon. In there for a strike. Eric Hinsky is on deck. Not only an ASU Sun Devil, but a Horizon Husky. This really is a local boy here. And it's still amazing that Willie Bloomquist, at least on the big league level, is still the only Sun Devil to play for this organization. It's amazing how a program that's right there turned out so many good major league players. It just, for whatever reason, the it's always timing. What you need and depends on who's available when. Mm -hmm. And when you pick, yeah. yeah, yeah it's just absolutely. one of those weird oddities that just hasn't happened very often. But Tuffy's had a busy camp. He's played a lot this spring. A little chopper to the third base side. And there's Matt Williams. Once you have it, you never lose it. <laughs> the one hopper. There's, he looks better than now than when he was playing. I mean, he was a great player in his heyday. Unfortunately, some injuries later on in his career really kind of limited what he was able to do. But, uh, man, in the prime of his career, there was nobody better at third base than Matt Williams. And Kirk Gibson told us they ran a lot when they had runners on the bases. For one thing, part of that 2001 team, of course, managed by BB. But for one thing, you wanted to be aggressive on the bases, but also it was a chance to practice the signs as Tuffy Ghostwood strikes out. And... Before games, they would have Matt Williams in the clubhouse going through the signs as quickly as he possibly could, like super fast turbo signs to get the guys used to used to that. Because you, when you're out there, you want to make sure that, hey, we're getting the signs correctly. Guys are making the right reads and picking things up, and it all comes from right there. And you bring up another point uh, at this time. Most teams, once they get down to what their regular season roster will be, change the signs. Eric Kinski gives it a ride to left. Xavier Paul, two down. Usually you have a set of signs that you use in spring training that are very basic, very simple. Everybody can get them. 
and then uh, right before you go into the regular season because possibly some of the players that you've sent to the minor leagues or are traded or released may resurface with another team that you're playing against later in the summer and you don't want to use the same signs that that player saw in spring training so most teams will change their signs going into opening day need to get this guy on right here because he can put himself on third base in a hurry Tony Campana last man standing here 2-1 one more tomorrow afternoon, and then we are off and running Monday night. Ian Kennedy versus Adam Wainwright. And Tony Campana in that discussion, and as Kirk Gibson told us, the coaches will continue those discussions after the game tonight about that fourth outfielder spot, Campana or Marte, with all the injuries. Tony's down to his last strike. And they have options on Tony Campana. That's one of the reasons they went and got him from the Chicago Cubs. He's a good guy to keep in your system. He can be a weapon. And it will be ready when called upon to contribute. Still playing with some stitches in the back of his left hand that he got uh, after getting spiked in a stolen base attempt. It's amazing how often Major League players injure their hands and fingers while they're running the bases. And oftentimes you'll see base runners holding batting gloves in their bare hands and you wonder why don't they just put them in their pocket because that forces the runner or the player for that matter to remember to squeeze his fingers together so the fingers don't get extended when you're say sliding headfirst into a bag and then possibly injured. If you're holding your batting glove in your bare hand, you're making a fist and you reduce the risk of injury. Two two to Campana. He's run it full. And if he can get on, Alfredo Marte will come up. And Marte has launched some moonshots this week. A couple of big home runs at Salt River Fields. He hit one Tuesday night that finished just under the scoreboard in left center. And it's an interesting dynamic. Do you go if you have to fill the fourth outfielder spot with Campana, who, as we know, gives you the speed element, or Marte, who can hit one 450 feet on a moment's notice? I mean, the, the, the power has been consistently there for Alfredo Marte this spring. So it's a, an interesting decision for Kirk Gibson. Campana draws a walk. Diamondback still alive here with two outs in the ninth, and Marte will get a chance. Uh, just comparing Campana and Marte, each guy brings something different to the table. Uh, you know, you really have to look at your entire roster. Where would Campana be used? Where might I pinch run in this lineup late in the ball game and use a weapon like Tony Campana off the bench? Or are you better served with a right-handed pinch hitter that can hit the ball up in Friday's front row grill? Uh, it, it really just involves a lot of conversation, a lot of talk about how the lineup sets itself and where do you need it. There goes Campana. He's in there. It gets into center field. He'll hold up at second base. So the tying run in scoring position here with two outs. And in terms of the percentages, BB, Tony Campana is as good as anyone in the major leagues at stealing a base. He was already into his slide before that ball even got down close to second base. Tremendous acceleration. And always dangerous head first slide which put him in a position where he didn't immediately see that overthrow wasn't able to advance on to third base since 2011 tony campana 54 for 59 ranked second in the major leagues behind only everett cabrera he's the tying run with two outs here's the 1-0 to Marte. 2-0 Tuesday night against the Angels, Alfredo Marte hit one a mile high, deep and gone. And then the next afternoon against the Giants, hit a line drive shot out to left center. Really shown some pop here in the last week or so, while the D-backs are thinking about who should they have for their fourth outfielder. And as we mentioned a moment ago, it's all about timing, opportunity. Suddenly you may have a, an extra outfield spot, and... 
Suddenly you got a guy here who you thought was maybe a little bit further away. He steps up and shows you something last week or 10 days. Right back at Simon. That might have gotten through if it would have, would have tied the game with Campana's speed. Instead, it's the final out, and the D-backs lose here 2-1. But, B.B., despite the 2-1 loss, I think tonight is an enormous success for the Diamondbacks because of what Pat Corbin did. Uh, I don't think there's any question about it. All eyes were on Patrick Corbin tonight. I've talked about it repeatedly throughout the telecast. He went out there with a lot of confidence, a lot of poise. He's always had great stuff, but tonight he was able to use it and uh, use it very effectively against a really good Reds offensive lineup. Tremendously impressive. Yeah, with the exception perhaps of Brandon Phillips, this was the Reds' A team, and Pat Corbin looked terrific. Six innings, gave up only two hits, walked two, and had seven strikeouts. Once again, our final score is 2 1. Remember, next time in back telecast on Fox Sports Arizona, Monday, April 1st. Hey, it's opening day against the St. Louis Cardinals. Starts at 6 o'clock with all the pregame festivities. Be sure to tune in and check your local listings. That's it for Bob Brenly. I'm Steve Berthium. Jody Jackson is up right now. Jody. Thanks a lot, Stephen.